Ready to go. All righty. <clears throat> okay, we're live. Okay, thanks. Uh, so my name is uh, Paul Tagley Ferry. I am the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for Northboro. It is May 23rd, 2023, and it is past the hour of 7 p.m. So we can get started. Um, this open meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law March 29, 2023. All members of the ZBA are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The act allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to Northboro Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link listed on the agenda. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Uh, members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Fran Backstrand. Here. Mark Rutan. Here. Brad Blanchett. Here. Susie Sislika. Here. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Fred Litchfield. Here. Uh, Robert Federico? Here. And Lori Connors? Here. Okay, uh, so just some basic <clears throat> um, meeting uh, ground rules. Uh, for presenters and applicants listening to the agenda, the chair will invite each speaker or applicant on the agenda by name to make the presentation and speak to their application. Participants will provide their full name and hold until their name is called. Each speaker will be asked to mute their phone or computer when not speaking and to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate meeting minutes. Those responding will be asked to wait until the floor is yielded to them by the chair. Speakers who wish to respond to comments of others do so through the chair, taking care to identify themselves. Each vote taken by the board of committee will be conducted by roll call vote. Uh, for, and this is for items related to public comment. Um, if you are on uh, this meeting by phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be recognized by the chair. Please note that part of your phone number will be visible to those viewing the meeting. Um, if you are on by Zoom, please click raise hand at the bottom of your screen and wait to be recognized by the chair. Uh, the chair will ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all the public commentators, the chair will, will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. All right, so before we get started, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, uh, so Fred sent an email a couple of weeks ago um, notifying the board that he's retiring at the end of June. Uh, Fred has worked as the town engineer for the, in Northboro for the last 25 years, um, and I would just like to thank him uh, for all his hard work and help with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I know everyone on this board and previous members have all benefited from his experience and expertise, uh, and Fred, we appreciate everything you have done for the town of Northboro. Uh, I know you still have one more meeting left to answer all of our <laughs> dumb, I mean, all of our questions, um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much for everything for the last 25 years. Uh, and we wish you nothing but the best of luck in retirement. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. And I've enjoyed uh, working here the entire time. Great. All right. So uh, we, we are going to start with uh, the application for, um, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're sorry, we're going to move the application for Victoria Camarado to first. Uh, so we are going to consider the petition for Victoria Camarado for a special permit for indoor commercial recreation use and special permit with site plan approval for the operation of a yoga and meditation studio on the property located at 299 West Main Street, Map 82, Parcel 7 in the Business West Zoning District. And... Okay. Hello, sorry, can you hear us? Yeah, the video is gonna take a minute to kick on. Okay. Yep, just on. Hello. Hi, Um, just one second, I'm getting the video going. I'll work on that. Start talking. Okay. Hi, my name is Victoria Morano. Oh, 
Did we lose her? Can you guys hear? No. Am I the, no. All right. Hi, Victoria. Can you hear us? Sorry, we got kicked off. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, video starting. There we go. Hi, go. sorry about that. That's okay, that's um, okay. So I'm Victoria Camerano. <laughs> this is my husband, Anthony. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time and meeting with us and reviewing the case. Um, so I am working on growing my business presence in North Row and opening a yoga and meditation studio. I currently own and operate a crystal shop. Um, it's called the Stone Collector. It's actually in the same building as the proposed yoga and meditation studio. Um, and there we sell things like uh, meditation items. We sell crystals, um, jewelry, home decor, things like that. Um, and we also offer Reiki healing sessions. And we have a few classes a week as well. Um, I have been a registered yoga teacher in the area for a little over six years. Um, I've taught through North Bro. Um, I've taught at Core Connection. I've taught at Ebb and Flow when that still existed. Um, and I've also taught throughout Grafton, Westboro, Sutton, and Worcester. Um, and I've built up a really great community of students already. And I want to continue to build that community. Um, and I really want to do that in North Bro. I love North Bro. Um, and I think that this business will improve the community by bringing peace, bringing um, mindfulness, connection, and then also physical well being to the residents of Northboro and the surrounding areas. This business also, I believe, fits really well in this location. The um, other businesses in the area fit well with it. Um, like we've got a salon um, and have. Um, another place that does different spa things and some office buildings um, in my crystal shop. Um, and this shop, this uh, studio won't be loud or disturbing in any way. Like we're going to have some music for yoga, but it's not going to be anything distracting to the surrounding businesses. Um, and nothing's going to change about the structure of the building. It already exists. So I'm not building any structures. I'm just doing like some cosmetic work inside, like painting and adding in floating floors. Um, the parking lot is also big enough to accommodate for this business. Um, in the upper lot, there's about 14 spaces, which I see maybe about four of those filled each day. Um, so there's plenty of space there as well as the bottom lot that is like connected with Romaine's in that whole area is huge. So there's definitely enough space there um, as well as traffic patterns being okay where it's not a very congested area. So I don't foresee that changing any of the traffic patterns. Um, and then a little bit about the business. So the class capacity is going to be about 14 people. Um, the big area within it is about 500, maybe 450 square feet. Um, so I think we'll comfortably fit 14. Um, and we're going to have a scheduling app. We're in the process of creating that. Um, that will have liability waivers attached and all of that kind of stuff. We'll have about three to four independent contractors working as teachers there. Um, and for hours, I anticipate about one morning class um, on the weekdays between the hours of about eight and 10. And then at night, probably two classes between the hours of five and 9 p.m. Um, weekends, uh, two or one classes a day between about eight and 11. Um, so total, it would be about 16 classes per week um, with obviously a little bit of room for growth, but I don't foresee it being too much more than that. Um, and I think that's my whole spiel. So <laughs> if anybody has any questions. Um, so I guess I'll start. So for looking at this location, are you, the, the studio is gonna be sort of on the Easterly building, the one not connected to Romaine's? Yes, the one not connected. Okay. And then how, how many parking spaces are in that sort of upper lot? Um, the upper lot has about 14, I would say. Okay. And then the lower lot has 
a bunch, right? A lot. A, a lot. <laughs> right, I would yeah. say maybe like if my best guess, like oh, yeah, like 150. Okay. All right. Um, do it any does anyone from town staff have any comments? Nope. I have no concerns about this application. Okay. Uh, Susie, I think you had your hand raised. I just have a maybe a little random question. I've been in your store before. Is there going to be a connection oh. between your store and the studio? An inner connection inside the building? Or are they not located? Or will there not be? Um, so that's all, first of all, really awesome. You've been in the store. That's great. Um, so there's not going to be a connection. Um, there is a little walkway around the building that leads from one space to the other, um, like a little brick path, but there's nothing inside. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any, anyone else from the, uh, the board that has any other questions or comments? All right, this is a public meeting. Um, if you are on your phone, please dial star nine. Um, if you are on Zoom, please click the raised hand icon. Okay, uh, I don't see any raised hands uh, or people trying to call in. Um, uh, are there any one, other? One thing, Paul. Oh, Mr. Chair. If I oh, might. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, with the entrance to this um, and possibly operation late at night over the winter, uh, any lighting needed outside your entrance that the uh, that you don't currently provide for the uh, the current shop you have there? Have you thought about that? Is there any lighting issues? So I don't believe there's any issues with lighting. Um, I will have to double check that, but there is a small light outside that I think provides adequate enough lighting. Okay. Just wondering. Again, I, I expect you'll have traffic of, you know, maybe 10 people walking out at mm -hmm. 9 p.m. Um, yeah, I would definitely make sure that there was good lighting so that people could safely get to their cars, especially in the winter and with ice and things like that. Right. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Brad, did you have? Um... Nope. All sets, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Fran. All right. So just real quick, because there is an indication that um, the only um, installation will be signage. Is that just when you're going to add yoga to your exterior signs? Um, so for the signs, I had a page that showed um, a design idea, um, just like a really rough draft. Um, currently, there are two sign spots for the business that was there prior. Um, it's, I think there should be a picture of the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, it's the red one that says Wellspring. So that's where the two signs will go, um, but it's just gonna be changing them to say tree pose yoga. They'll be green signs. All right. So only if the signs are a continuing issue in town, I would just recommend that you meet up with our building inspector before you invest in any signage. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that is very good to know, especially with how pricey they are. <laughs> Uh, it, it, generally, if you contract a sign company that is local, um, mm -hmm. they have experience in dealing with the permitting system and the rules and regulations that's in the zoning code for your particular uh, building. Um, so um, I would recommend you do that. Uh, it would make things a lot easier for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the board or staff? I'll do one last check for the public. All right. Is, uh, Mark. Uh, just I uh, move that we close the hearing. Second. All right. Uh, so Mark has made a motion to close the hearing. Uh, Fran was on the second? Yep. Yes. So roll call vote to close the hearing, uh, Mark. Aye. 
Fran? Aye. Brad? Aye. Susie? Aye. Now I am an aye as well. All right, great. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Thank we'll have a decision you. most have likely later night. tonight. Thank okay. you. Have a good one. Thanks. All right, so next up um, is to consider the petition of 78 WLLC for dimensional variance for insufficient area, uh, a special permit to expand a non conforming structure, uh, special permits for multifamily use in the downtown business district, and groundwater protection overlay district two and three, a special permit to extend a use into a more restricted groundwater protection overlay district by no more than 50 feet, and a special permit with site plan review for a proposed multifamily expansion to an existing structure at 78 West Main Street, map 63, parcel uh, 55. Uh, all right. and for that, I believe Marshall Gould will be the presenter. So Other people, uh, Tom, Tom Reardon is probably here. Okay. Speak. Hello, Marshall. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right. Just moving uh, Tom Reardon. as well as a panelist. We have Tom Reardon and I believe we're gonna be having Randy Waterman from WDA. Oh, hi Tom. Uh, Randy Waterman from WDA, he's the engineer on this. Okay. I don't know if he's here or not. Yeah, I see Randy Waterman in the uh, thing, just moving him in now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Marshall, whenever you're ready, uh, okay. if you want to just give us a brief overview and so I uh, was I've Marshall. Heard. One thing uh, was yeah. Carolyn on the list. Can she join as well? Absolutely, Carolyn Burke. And Carolyn is from Randy Waterman's office, and she's involved in landscaping and the engineering as well. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, Paul, the public hearing notice. Might want to read that. The what? Public hearing notice. To consider the petition? Yes. Yeah, I thought I read that. Yeah, you did already, Laura. I'm, I'm sorry, I must have missed it. It was quick. <laughs> Shall I proceed? Right, so, uh, yes. So I think uh, Carolyn Burke is, is being added now. So, uh, Marshall, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the board's time on this matter. Uh, I'll give you first the introduction of the parties. We have the owner is Sam Lodiff. And I don't know if Sam has been admitted in yet. I don't see his picture. I see a name there that I don't recognize, Owen Jones. I don't know whether he might be on that one or not. Uh, Owen is uh, te technical support for the town of North Burlington. Oh, all right. My, there's. Uh, I'm, I'm adding uh, Sam now. Thank you very much. So, sorry about that. Problem. So Sam is actually the owner of the property through an LLC, uh, the name of which is 78W LLC, standing for 78 West Main Street. Uh, he is the owner of this and other properties in Northboro, and he actually lives in Southboro. He's a real gentleman and he's got other properties and he takes pride in all of his properties. We also have um, the team includes Tom Reardon, who I believe you all know. Tom's a well-known, very well-respected architect who's been brought in to not just preserve the look of this beautiful building, but to enhance it with a small footprint addition 
on the side and in the back. Tom will explain them. We also have Randy and we have, uh, who did you say? I'm sorry, is it Carol? Carolyn? Carolyn. Carolyn Burke, thank you. Carolyn, we've talked on the phone, we haven't met face. Um, so what we're going to do tonight with your permission, you've already indicated what the permits are that we're going for. So I think it would be helpful to understand the property. So with the chair's permission, instead of my going into the full application, uh, what I'd like to do is just simply say, it has been a commercial use for a number of years now, but for about 90 years after it was built, it was a residential property. And when Sam bought it, he saw the beauty of the structure and decided he wanted to bring it back to residential. So instead of my going over all the facts for the special permit and the variance, I'd like Tom to describe the building from an architect's point of view and what's going to be done with it, if that's okay with the chairman. Uh, yeah, that works. Uh, and if, if it's easier to share your screen with architectural drawings, um, you can do that as well. Okay, my name is Tom Reardon. I'm the project architect. Um, uh, before I start, I would like to mention that I've been an architect in Northboro for 40 years, and I've done about 20 commercial projects. And I've had uh, great pleasure working with Fred for many of these projects. And I appreciate his knowledge and expertise and his dry wit. So uh, thank you, Fred, for all the time we've worked together. Thanks, Tom. So um, my client, Sam Ludov, had some clear goals in mind when he purchased his property. He wanted to return it to residential use, as Marshall mentioned, uh, <clears throat> upgrade the structure in terms of energy efficiency and fire protection. Um, he wanted to preserve the historic nature of the building, and he wanted to bring some residences, multifamily type structures into the downtown area. And he believed that this would complement all the goals of the town's master plan from um, 2020. There is a lot of challenges developing on the north side of West Main Street due to the unusual small sizes and the fact that the entire downtown business is in groundwater two and three. So you have 66% of all the commercial properties are non-conforming. And that explains to a degree why there are so many special permits and variances requested because of the unusual nature of these properties. Uh, speaking to the architecture, this. This is a very common uh, New England style. It's part of the what we call the classical vernacular. The appropriate uh, other names are the I house or it's the basis of the American farmhouse. So what you have is a gable to the road, like the temple front. You often have narrow, tall structures, anywhere from 20 to 28 feet wide, uh, higher pitched roofs, and you often have uh, single story porches wrap around the front to the sides. And these are the features that Sam wanted to retain while upgrading the structure. And what he's proposing is to convert the, this office space into four two bedroom units. The units range from 1100 to 1200 square feet each. Um, they all have their own separate entries. As I said, the building will be fully sprinkled. And um, in terms of an overview of that's I will stop there and turn it back over to Marshall if you want to go into the site design and then we get back to the building. You're muted. Marshall, you're on mute. I apologize. I didn't want to interrupt Tom. He's more interesting than I am. <laughs> uh, so I will, with your permission, I'd like to just briefly walk you through the application that I think explains everything. But statutorily, since I'm supposed to address all the points, I assume all of you have a copy of the application. I have numbered all the pages, so I may refer to certain numbers. I'm actually starting on page two. The first paragraph just recites all of the permits, variances, and site plan review that were on the zoning determination letter I received from Bob Frederico and by the way, I want to compliment 
not just Fred, but Lori and Bob. They are extremely helpful when somebody comes in to do anything in town. They answer questions. They point us in the right direction. They are very patient. So I thank all of you. And I'm saying this in part because this may be my last hearing in Northboro, because after 50 years, I'm going to be retiring. <laughs> so, uh, and I was actually involved when Fred was hired. I was on the committee to hire him. And I'm pleased to say we did a very good job. Uh, I was on the committee to hire both Kathy Jubert and Fred. So I've watched them with great pride through the years. In any event, back to the application. Um, the first item at the bottom of page two is a variance. This lot was a non-conforming lot by virtue of its size because of groundwater. If we want to do anything here, uh, we're supposed to have at least 20,000 square feet. And that's supposed to be in an in the groundwater two area, I'm sorry, three area, not area two. We do not have enough. And I believe that this application points out that the area three is in the front on Main Street. And as Tom pointed out, and as you can see on page 10 of my application, if you wanna go there, if you see where Main Street, West Main Street is, you can see that every lot from Church Street way down West Main, they're all split lots between groundwater area two and area three. And so most of these lots may be now non-conforming if they have buildings. And this is one good example. Uh, we are asking for a variance and we believe that there are very good grounds for it. The fact that we are between groundwater area two split with groundwater area three uh, shows that there is a difference in the soils and the infiltrations into the well, the town, the former town wells, the aquifers. And what we are trying to do is remove some of the nonconformity. Currently, the parking lot of the building goes well behind the building. And what this project will do is remove almost all of the paving that is in groundwater area two. When the engineer talks, he'll, he'll show you that on his plan. And we're moving it, the parking all up into area three instead of area two, so that it will have less impact to the groundwater in the town. We're also putting in stormwater uh, drainage plans where there are none right now. So that's the, the square footage is the reason for the variance. The hardship caused by this uh, on page three, item number two, being located in groundwater area two does not allow the house to be expanded although there's quite a bit of land in the rear on the north of the property. What we're trying to do is remove existing pavement and not do any development in groundwater area three. And that's why we're moving the parking up closer to West Main Street. And that will be one of the waivers that we are seeking that I'll get into. Um, Tom has already spoken about what I have as item number three being the uh, addition to the Victorian house and moving the parking will present a very attractive property on West Main Street. It's in the middle of two commercial buildings, Dunkin' Donuts and a dental building on both sides. And across the street, there is a restaurant and a health club and some other uses over there. So this will be a residential use, which is in line with what the master plan committee has called for in the development of the downtown area. And I think it's gonna serve a very valid purpose. Lastly, uh, on number four, we're saying that the proposed improvements are in accordance with the expressed intent of multiple boards and committees in town and will help to improve the appearance and bring vitality to the downtown business district. It's an appropriate location because it was 
a residence for 90 years, and it's not been that long that it's been a commercial use. It is not going to change the appearance other than to make it a little larger, but Tom's gonna to make sure it still looks like a beautiful Victorian uh, building. And there will actually be less traffic caused by these four residences than the, uh, than the traffic that was created by a business that was there. We did have a traffic analysis done. It was submitted. We're not having the traffic consultant in and we're not gonna go over it because the summary is there will be less traffic from this use on West Main, including at peak hours than from the prior use. Uh, the redesigned house and parking lot, we've already said we'll reduce the impervious area and groundwater three, I'm sorry, groundwater two, and move some of the parking spaces up into groundwater area two. That's basically our application. Uh, with that, unless the board has any specific questions of the legalities, I'd like to call on Randy or Carolyn to briefly explain the engineering of the site and what changes will be made. Sure, I can give you a quick, quick rundown. Uh, essentially, as you can imagine, since the site was built so long ago, uh, the, the parking and the site landscaping and um, associated improvements are, are sort of tired and, and need some work. And uh, the parking was pretty haphazard. So vehicles would pull in when this was a business and there's just a large area that they turned around, nothing was lined. So uh, it, was, it was kind of a, a free for all in the parking lot. So what we've done is we've really realigned the parking spaces on the side of the building and set them up so that they conform to your requirements. And we have a total of nine spaces on the site and they're shown the shaded area just on the right side of the building. Uh, so there's two spaces for each unit plus one site for visitors. And uh, so the site's being slightly regraded to pitch the water to the back. And so you can see that uh, oval shape at the back of the site. That area is currently paved. So we're removing the pavement from that area and that's the area that uh, Marshall's talking about where we'll have a less impervious surface and more infiltration. And so there'll be a rain garden that would be built in that section of the area where the pavement's being removed. So that will be turned to green space. And then the other benefit is that uh, just about in the center of the parking lot, there'll be an underground infiltration system that will pick up the roof runoff from the building and direct that over into that infiltration area and then the overflow would go down to that rain garden again. And that's shown as that's the rectangle that's just in the center of the parking lot there. And uh, so that will connect to actual drainage structures and a water quality outlet uh, structure before it goes down to the rain garden. So again, today the, the parking is in, in sad shape and also has no infiltration, no surface drainage pickup whatsoever. So any runoff from the summer or even in the winter when you get more sediment in the ground on the surface, all that's just being directly discharged to the wetland right now. So by removing the pavement, replacing that with the, the uh, rain garden, we'll have a significant change in uh, improvement in environmental conditions in the uh, wetland, the groundwater area and the floodplain as well. Um, the other thing that, like I say, the, the landscaping was a little tired. Um, Carolyn Burke was our senior landscape architect has put together a, a very nice plan of uh, how to approach the site. And she's got some nice uh, buffer plantings that we talked about with some of the other boards, the design review board mostly, and uh, some other plantings at the entrance to the site. And, uh, and we're trying to retain some of the vegetation that's actually still suitable. Um, and uh, you can see the rain garden is extensively planted in the back, which is really, you know, somewhat of a little bit of a difficult process since you have to make it so it works when the ground is wet and the plants are getting wet, but also it looks good in the summertime when it's bone dry. So it's a little tricky, but we have a, a fairly intensive landscape palette there and uh, Carolyn can answer any questions or specifics about the, the landscaping as shown on the plan. Carolyn, do you want to address that at all? Bob, are there specific questions? 
let me interject at this point. It might be helpful. <clears throat> Along with my application, uh, there were two waivers. And I don't know if the board has received the letter that I sent. Uh, it was dated May 18th. I think it was delivered on May 19th on Friday. And this is uh, thanks to the help of Lori. She pointed out the first waiver is under a section of the bylaw that says in downtown area, no parking will be located closer to the front lot line than the front line of the actual structure nearest to the lot line. We, by, by moving some of the parking lot closer to Main Street, um, we had to move two and three quarters of the front three parking spaces that are equal to or in front of the building. So we are asking for a waiver on that request. The second one does relate to landscaping. And that is that the bylaw requires that the proposed buffer uh, of landscape buffer be 10 feet wide to the side properties. The side uh, adjoining the property is the easterly side of Dunkin' Donuts. Between the Dunkin' Donuts drive-through and their driveway, there is quite a bit of uh, landscaping, natural landscaping, there are trees and bushes. And in order to accommodate the parking and take it out of groundwater area two, it leaves us with, and whoever has the arrow can point it out here, uh, on the right where the arrow is, that line of landscaping goes from four feet to 10 feet. So we are asking for a waiver on that. And we feel that the intent is to provide landscaping of adequate density and height to provide screening of parked vehicles to the abutter. And because there's already a wooded landscape buffer and it's actually right next to the drive-through lane uh, or exit drive-through lane of Dunkin' Donuts, uh, it will not be a problem at all if they see, they, they probably won't see unless maybe in the wintertime, they won't see any of the parked vehicles, but we are still providing a line of landscaping. So if you have any questions about that, Carolyn can certainly answer. I, mean, I, I guess just in, in terms of landscaping, do you want to just give like sort of an overview of what is changing, what's being added? Um, you know, obviously they're, they're, the parking in, in back is being taken away, but there is a rain garden. What's the purpose of that? What's going in there? If you want to just give sort of just a high level of that, that'd be, that'd be great. Sure, sure. So yes, we are at the front of the property. We are retaining uh, existing ornamental shrubs and trees, uh, and we are uh, proposing to uh, improve the aesthetic with the addition of some shrubs. Uh, we've had discussion for uh, with the town along the west side of their property to incorporate some screen planting along the property line, uh, which consists of evergreen shrubs and trees. Um, down towards the conservation area. And then along the east side, as Marshall has just discussed, uh, we do have uh, the woodland, significant woodland buffer between this property and the neighboring Dunkin' Donuts. And we do have a proposed uh, landscape buffer that consists of evergreen shrubs, uh, as well as some deciduous shrubs in front of the um, bordering uh, woodland area. Uh, with regard to uh, the the uh, rain garden that consists of a mixture of of uh, largely perennials and some grasses, and then it is surrounded along the wetland buffer by again a, a conservation mix of native plantings of shrubs and trees. Okay, thank you. Tom, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about and point out exactly where the additions are so that they can see the minimal impact and what you're doing architecturally? Is Tom still here? Uh, Tom, you're Tom, on mute. Tom, you're muted. 
Thumbs on mute. Okay. Hi, Tom. All right. So um, we can go. Yeah. Can you go to the first floor plan? <clears throat> go up. Okay, so we could start here, the basement plan. This this section here in the, the post-shade section, that is the existing stone foundation from the 1890s. That is being retained. There's nothing uh, uh, habitable about it. We're probably using it as a, we're gonna need a sprinkler room. We're gonna have some utilities and so forth. Um, so. That is going to re remain. The two additions to the west is here and to the north is here. And we match the width of the additions with the existing building. So the additions were not taller than the, the height of the existing roof. So we're, we're trying to keep that narrow profile or massing typical of the these, these Greek uh, classical vernacular buildings. Um, so we'll have a uh, partial basement over here, and this will be up <clears> here will be an entrance for one of the units. And if we could go to first floor. Again, the, the portion of the building that has the pochade walls, that's existing. And we are pretty much going to be able to retain the interior uh, millwork and layout of that this portion of the first floor. You have one entrance here, one entrance here, and this is an entrance over here going up. So the basement entry would go up to this area. That's one unit. This main entry facing the road is the second unit. It's they're all two stories, and this is the third entrance. So if we could go to the next level. So on the second floor, again, you can see that we have the two bedrooms, bathrooms, and this is the upper level of uh, one of the third units. And on the attic, we have a, a one bedroom with a bath uh, that, that enables us to get four units, two bedrooms each with their own separate entries. Uh, whenever you build three or more residential units, it will have to have a, uh, a sprinkler system. You'll have full fire alarm. I mean, uh, smoke and heat detectors, carbon detectors, and so forth. Now, if we could go to the building elevations. So if we get down a little bit so I can see the front. So this dotted line here indicates the, the existing portion that you see today. So you have the, the, the temple front we talked about, you have the wraparound porch on the first floor and the balustrade. So the Western L, um, edition matches the height of this little piece here. And we're replicating the double hung windows with the uh, you know the six over six pattern we are replacing the siding we're replacing the windows um we want to maintain the you know these tuscan columns with the balusters throughout um the the next elevation is in the rear where you see the the grade drops off and <clears throat> so you have like a walkout basement at the lower level. So again, you can see how we're, we're, here is our existing building line right in here. And this is the addition. We could go to the next one. So the, the, the right side is facing east. Again, this dotted line is the existing structure. It goes like this and then over. So there's a, a back section is only one story. So we're going to build on top of that and behind it. Um, <clears throat> we're retaining the existing porch and the, the patterns of the windows. This particular um, 
elevation facing west, you can see where the grade is dropping down and we're replicating the, the pattern of the existing uh, fenestration on this Victorian style building. So those are the proposed changes. We have two wings coming off the side and the rear, try to keep them the massing and the detailing compatible with the existing architecture because that's one of Sam's goals is to respect the historic nature of the existing house. So that's the architecture. Any questions? So okay. that completes our presentation for now. Um, okay. If the board has any questions. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Laura, Laura, are you in control of the, uh, uh, the screen right now? Yes, that's me. Uh, can you just scroll to the layout and materials plan? So I think the way I look at this plan or this project, um, you know, I think that there are several things that I like about it. Um, uh, you know, removing all the paving from the groundwater to mm -hmm. uh, updating the house to an energy efficiency. Um, I think it's great that you, your plan is to preserve the historical building um, that's been in Northboro for a very long time. Um, I do think that multifamily housing um, in the downtown neighborhood uh, is an appropriate use there. Um, and also the stormwater drainage plans, I think are beneficial to sort of the groundwater and protecting our groundwater um, supply. Um, the, the, the one thing I wanna start with is sort of the impact on the wetlands, okay? And the two additions to the west and to the north um, by a very rough calculation are about a 780 is square feet of additions that are going west of the building and north of the building. And both of those additions are all within sort of the no build wetland setback. And so I'm trying to understand what impact that has mm -hmm. to the wetlands. Okay. Uh, I can address that. Um, again, um, you know, working directly with Tom up front, really on how do you create four units in this building? There were only several options. He really couldn't come out the front of the building. And so it was really on the right-hand side, you're coming out into the parking lot. So the only two places left to try and accomplish it was uh, west and north. The north edition today is a, if we go to our existing conditions plan, the north edition is what's on a deck, a staircase and pavement. Um, if we can just flip back to that one for a minute. That's good. Um, that's the site improvement one, but that's fine. So essentially you can see the existing building on the plan and then just to the north edge of it, that dark dash line, that's the edge of the pavement today. So by adding the addition back there, we weren't expanding the footprint of the impervious we were covering that area where the, the cloud is, removing those two decks, the staircase, and quite a bit of pavement. Mm -hmm. And so um, that seemed, you know, like it made sense to uh, use that as a site for one of the additions since it's already covered uh, with pavement. Uh, on the west side of the building, uh, that was really the only other place where he could make this, uh, the whole layout work. And since we're abutting another commercial use on that side, we thought that it would probably be, you know, more reasonably acceptable to go that direction. Um, once we had both of these sketched out, we asked the uh, agent from the Conservation Commission to come out and walk it with our wetlands person. And um, they talked about uh, that edge of the wetland just to the north of this uh, westerly addition. That edge of the wetland has been uh, kind of beat up a little bit over the years between you know, people getting around the back of the building and mowing and, and not having a clear defined wetland edge. And so it was decided at those site meetings with the conservation agent that if we could actually bring some um, native wetland plants and buffer plants into that area, 
and then probably put a fence or something to block future access down there that they thought that would be a good trade-off. Um, and then again, that was hand in hand with removing that large section of pavement that's closer to the wetland at the same time. So although the additions do move closer to the wetland uh, edge, we are not altering any wetland itself and we are in improving the buffer zone. And that's shown on the landscape plan. You can see the, the dense buffer that's added around there as well as the fence and the rain garden. It's just, it was just a very, very tight site. And, and you know, again, trying to respect the, the building and, and the architecture was, it was a, a, a tough process at the beginning to make it all work. Yeah, I agree, it is a, it is a very tight site. Um, so did you go in front of the Northboro Conservation Committee or was it just the conservation agent? Is that- we had the, the, the agent and the chairman both came out uh, one or two of the walks that we had. And um, we have not filed the notice. The notice of intent is in progress. We're waiting to get through the process where we had comments from design review and other boards. So we are putting the application together now and I think it will be filed later this week. So then we will go with the, you know, in front of the full commission, obviously, but we, they, they've asked us in the past that we don't come until we have all of the permits, so. <clears throat> Conservation has said that? Yes. But, but again, that, that application will be, is to be filed immediately. And, and uh, now that we have all the changes that we've gotten from all the other boards uh, up to this point, um, that's usually the best time to go so that we don't have to try and go back and amend an order later. But we have walked it at least twice with the agent and once, uh, once or twice with the chair. I guess I remember having a conservation's opinion on things that usually involve encroaching on wetlands, but um, okay. Um, I guess then the, the other question I have um, before I will open it up to the board um, is, uh, Lori, if you can go back to the layout and materials plan for a second. Um, so I think you had mentioned earlier that this is a tight site and I, I do agree with that assessment. Um, and so I think the thing that does concern me with this uh, tight site um, is where do you put the snow? If you look um, at this driveway and <clears throat> you know, by any rough calculation, um, if you assume that there are nine parked cars in this driveway, um, you have to clear about 1,600 square feet of driveway. Um, I'm not a professional snowplow driver, mm -hmm. but I don't really see a place anywhere but back into the rain garden to clear all of the snow. And just to kind of give some perspective on how much snow we're talking about here, if you do the calculation of say six inches of snow on a snow, on a, a, you know, say a snowstorm comes in, there's six inches. Mm -hmm. That's about that's about thirty yards of snow that needs to be cleared, just in the drive aisle area. Mm -hmm. And so yep. I'm concerned with where does that snow go? Um, the main location would be as you look along the parking spaces themselves, the very last parking space, just beyond that, there's an area that will be lawn there that was essentially left open for that purpose. Um, there will be a fence between it and the rain garden so that they cannot go past that. So they would be able to push snow in that area. And we've talked to Sam a little bit and we've all acknowledged that when you have a foot of snow here and you're trying to open up in the morning, you're probably not gonna, you're gonna either have to plow a couple of spaces because you're gonna have less people showing up for work, but most likely you're gonna have to remove snow from the site. There's just not, there's not enough area to, to um, put it anywhere and you can't put it in the rain garden and you really can't put it up in the front yard at all. So uh, there's only one other option and that's to remove it from the site. Okay, and is that something, okay. Um, so along that back line where the uh, dumpster is, mm -hmm. um, 
<clears throat> will there be a fence that runs through the back of that? Meaning that if someone did try to plot push snow into the back, that they would run into a fence or something. I assume that, yes, I believe the dumpster is fenced in, right? But uh, yes. That sort of empty yes. space. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. No, the dumpster has its own enclosure. And then if you're on the layout materials plan, you'll see a, a straight line right at the south edge of that rain garden. And that's a, a split rail fence that we had talked about with the commission about having out there. So that would keep anyone, so they would be able to push snow over that opening in the curb to that grass area. And then that's as far as they could go. Uh, that's all. I think that there is a fence here. Uh, so, Lori, the uh, plan that you are showing is prior to the revised plan that was submitted to you on yep. May 9th that does show the fence between the lawn area and the rain garden. Yeah, this one still has it behind to the north of the rain garden, you're right. Yeah, the one I'm looking at has it correct to the revised plan. So we were asked to pull that fence over to the south side of the rain garden so people could not get into the rain garden and wander around when they're visiting the site. Yes, I just looked at the updated plan and that is the case. I'll see if I can find it on the website. Oops. Okay. Um, so I think at this point, uh, if anyone on the board has any uh Susie, I think it looks like you have your hand up. And then Fran as well. Hi, my name's Susie. Um, I had a couple of questions just about the parking lot. It seemed kind of tight. I have a minivan and I've driven an SUV before. Um, and I was just wondering, it's hard to read on the plan that we had because it's small. And then I was trying to zoom in on the, the plan mm -hmm. that we were shown. So that was my first question. How wide are those, are the spaces and are they big enough to fit if someone has like a large SUV that you see and um, how many spots are there per unit and do they allow for visitors? I know that you can't really park on Main Street in that area. The spaces are uh, nine by uh, 20 uh, conventional parking spaces and then the access drive is also 20 feet deep per the code um, and there are two parking spaces per unit per the code and one visitor space on site so there's nine new spaces there okay and then I got a little confused when we were um, when you were talking about um, the the planting that was going to be planted and what was going to be removed. And then because of what was on the Duncan side um, for the drive through, can you just re-explain that again? I got a little lost when we were talking about the drive through and if you were going to remove it or not. And, and I didn't want to interrupt you because it was your presentation and you were on a roll. <laughs> Sorry. Um well, this, this is the landscape plan here. So I think yeah. the area that we're talking about is this easterly lot line yeah. and that buffer between the pavement and the lot line. Yeah. And so you can see starting at the back of the site at the dumpster area, we have some shrubs planted along that zone. And then we come into the larger circles. Uh, I can't read that at this scale. Carolyn can tell us what those are. Um, and then what we were saying is just that last strip from the end of that land, proposed landscaping out to the street um, we left landscaping off of there uh, partially because um, directly opposite that lot line, next to that lot line, that is fairly dense shrubbery and vegetation that's grown up on the Dunkin' Donut site. Okay. And so their building is several hundred feet to the east of us. And so that whole area is quite dense. And the other thing that happens is as you come out of this driveway and you want to look left to the east down Main Street, we didn't want vegetation out there getting in the way of people as they're looking left. So just for a safety, so it just, it didn't benefit the site to have it or any, you know, with all the vegetation that's next to it here on the Duncan site, and it's quite a bit, and it's quite a bit of distance to their site. Um, it just, there was no logic to train stuff more landscaping in, so to speak. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I think that was everything for um, for now. I had questions about the snow removal as well, but um, I think you covered that for now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fred, I think you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to confirm on the picture that we have in the package on page eight. Um, that driveway is the current driveway that is the same 20 feet that is going to um, be utilized. It's not getting any bigger or smaller. Uh, the existing driveway is not quite 20 feet right now. So the driveway would be widened to be 20 feet. All right. and, and, and in doing that, we will uh, require a, a mass DOT permit. Okay. And the, the vegetation in the front of the building is not going to be any higher than what's there, right? I mean, part of the beauty of this building is actually being able to see it. Yeah, Carolyn, do you want to reply to that one? Yes, yeah, so we are uh, repurposing the existing vegetation in front of the building uh, and then the proposed vegetation that is uh, buffering the parking area can be maintained at a desirable height that is matching the existing. All right, and then um, to the chairman's point, I do feel like sometimes an applicant would go to conservation before they come to us but it does look like at least in the groundwater advisory recommendations um, or conditions, they, they indicate that an order of conditions must be obtained by the conservation before anything goes forward. So at least our bases are covered there. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And uh, Frank, I, you know, I did walk the site um, last week. I think it was last week. Um, the purple Japanese maple on the left side in that picture, friend, is staying just as an FYI. Um, and then bushes, uh, some of those bushes in front will be repurposed along the left side of the property. So I hope that helps. And I guess to your point about the conservation, I, I think my, I just really want to understand the impact to the wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, in sort of moving into the the no build zone, and and what that what that means, you know, I'm sure, you know, is it an improvement in getting the pavement off of, uh, out of you know groundwater two and three, and moving things closer to Route 20? Yes, um, but the no build zone, obviously, you know, there's a wetland rule for a reason, and I just want to, you know, just thinking about it out loud you know, make sure that every, every box has been checked um, mm -hmm. on that one. So that's just my, my, my thought process there. Okay. Um, Mark, yeah. Mark, I think um, you had your hand raised. Yes. Uh, two questions I have uh, first with the, um, is there room for a walkway along the street? If there were to put in a sidewalk, there's one now. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. And the other is, I noticed there are two decks on this building in the back for two of the units. Uh, no, the decks are existing that would be removed. Oh. Well, there are a couple of balconies proposed. Ba yeah, okay, balconies, right. So let me see if I can, there is yeah. one Picture here, that. And there's one here. Right. So I wanted to get some outdoor spaces for each of the units. Uh, and then, of course, this front porch can be shared by the two units that you come to off the front porch. Uh, this this is this is a stair, but there is a small deck up the so there, each unit has some outdoor balcony or porch. Yeah, my question was directly: um, What controls the front? The use of the front wraparound porch is that assigned to one unit, or is that a common space for all of them to? Uh have things on and well, how wide is that currently uh it's six feet wide there's an entrance here and there's mm -hmm. an entrance here mm -hmm. uh and i'm assuming that they would share this porch okay uh, it, it stops right here mm -hmm. okay 
that's it. So if I could elaborate, um, Chairman, on the, the the question of this, the existing building, this line here is the no build zone. So the existing building is already in the no build zone. And the two additions we're proposing, they don't go any closer to the wetlands than previous structures that already existed, which I think is 12 to 15 feet. So we're not getting any closer and we're reducing the area of impervious surface. But as we pointed out from the beginning, this is a ch challenging site because of the proximity of Cold Harbor Brook and the wetlands. And, you know, this building's been there for 130 years and just trying to improve on what we have. I got you. Um, are there any other, let's see, uh, Brad, yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking at your application, excuse me, on uh, page seven, exhibit one, and I am counting six cars with ample space to add additional cars. Um, and uh, Mr. Gould, you were talking about the traffic study. So can you explain like why or how less traffic with four units on a tight lot with only nine parking spots is potentially um, better than an office where you have the same volume, but there's more parking today? Yes, the traffic study that was submitted was done by Benathan Associates, transportation engineers and planners. They're out of Andover and they've done uh, a lot of work in Worcester County and on Route 20. Uh, and his, I'm not going to read his whole report, but his summary uh, towards the end before he gets into his peak hours, his summary says, with the reduction in traffic expected, and in the first three pages, he talked about the entire building was being used commercially. So there were employees who were coming in and out all day. And, and I believe that building, I believe the use was they were selling energy efficient systems. Yeah. Yes, so Northern were, Energy. Yep. So there were a lot of customers coming in and out, and they had employees and salespeople, and they had vendors coming in and out. And he's saying that he has done a couple of things. Uh, one is, if you look at page, I believe it's page four of his report, and it says they've done the traffic assessment for the redevelopment of the former office building to the multifamily housing building containing four two bedrooms. He says he did a uh, site driveway crash study, and from 2016 to 2023, the site had no crashes. The site distances exceed recommended levels as identified in state design guidelines, and that the proposed multifamily building is expected to generate fewer vehicle trips than the former office business use, which occupied the site. So he says in the next paragraph, any level of service analysis would show an improvement as a result of the change proposed for the site. The project would have a prod a uh, positive impact from the former use on traffic levels during daily and peak hour conditions as a result of the decrease in trip generations. And then he talks about there being no safety concerns, there were no crashes at the site. And so accordingly, their summation is that the proposed redevelopment for this use will result in less traffic impacts compared to the former, no concerns related to site distances or crash history, and it's their opinion that the project can be accommodated on the existing road system. I don't know if that's in the packet that everybody got, but um, it, it, I believe it was emailed or delivered mm -hmm. as part of the application. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but even the office building did not have a lot of traffic. But when you look at the studies, the ITE studies, using the building for all commercial versus for all residential results in a lesser volume of traffic. Okay, thank you. 
Sure. Uh, thank you, Marshall. Um, just, uh, oh, Mr. Uh, just, Chair. Uh, yeah, I Susie. Sorry. I Sorry. On the traffic, um, isn't this yep. going to be right across from our new fire station? I don't know if it's directly across or diagonally, but yes, the fire stations on the opposite side of the street. Yeah, so that might have to do with the, was that in the traffic impact study? Or um, that would not affect it because there. I mean, it, for the traffic safety, it might. For well, no, problem. if the fire department goes out, when they go on to Route 20, even when they go out of their existing building, they put on their sirens to exit onto any road and all traffic is expected to stop and there being less traffic here. And by the way, one of the comments that the traffic engineer said to me, but it was not in his report, he said in a commercial setting, you're gonna have more, not necessarily large trucks, but if they were selling solar systems, there would be delivery trucks. And then there would be um, some of the employees or installer trucks, whereas at a site like this, it's almost exclusively cars. So he said this will be a much simpler traffic use than the commercial use. And the fact that there's a fire station there uh, will not impact it. There's a much greater volume of traffic coming from all the buildings around it. And that's why the fire department, when they go on to these roads, they have their safety procedures, one of which is the use of sirens. We're not okay. going from a piece of virgin land with no use <clears throat> to suddenly a multi-unit building. We're going from a commercial use to a residential. Okay, thanks Marshall. Sure. Um, so I guess just, I, I wanna touch on quickly the groundwater letter um, from Fred. Yeah. Um, so I assume, uh, Fred, you want to just give sort of a high level, uh, at least for the groundwater letter, and then we can get into the, I do have a couple questions on your the town engineer letter, but if you want to just touch on groundwater real quick. Um, sure. Yeah. The, um, the groundwater bylaw requires that a multifamily unit get multifamily building, get a special permit in groundwater, uh, two and three, and they don't have the area, the 20,000 square feet. However, the lot did exist prior to the adoption of the groundwater bylaw, so there really isn't anything they could do about that. The groundwater committee did find that the stormwater improvements were an improvement. That coupled with the fact that although my letter says it's not, the other letter says it's not to be connected to town sewer, that was an error. They are proposing a town sewer connection. Uh, they're showing one on the plan. Uh, the discrepancy was that the DPW records don't show an actual connection in their files. Um, they show one on the plan. There may in fact be a connection, I'm not sure when or how it got connected. I know the plan is for them to be connected. So uh, the groundwater committee did see that as an improvement um, and recommended that the stormwater improvements were warranting the consideration, favorable consideration of the variance. Um, the impervious cover calculation uh, shows a significant improvement. They met the requirement for the uh, less than 15% increase in the volume of the runoff because they were able to recharge the roof runoff into that infiltration system that's partially under the driveway and parking lot. And then also they have some improvements and infiltration in within the uh, rain garden. So overall the drainage was an improvement. Um, I don't know if you want me to, to go each over each and every one. Um, I mean, I guess as long as the applicant doesn't have any issues with any of the conditions that are listed in your groundwater letter, um, I want to be just to have them be able to provide feedback, if any. Yep. Um, so one of the concerns that I had at it is a little different than one of my normal comments is, um, one, I was a little bit concerned about the separation between the bottom of the rain garden and the groundwater elevation. Just need to verify that that is, in fact, at least two feet when they actually get out there to do the work. And the permeability tests 
We normally require one in each of the infiltration areas prior to the building permit being issued. Uh, however, the engineer who attended the groundwater meeting explained that there was a issue with safety as a whole in order to get the permeability test at the depth that the infiltration was going to occur was rather deep and the hole was caving in. So rather than risk someone's safety, they opted not to do three permeability tests. They were able to do one and the assumptions that they made for the design of the infiltration was rather conservative. So my feeling is that the site will most likely be okay, but as while they're out there doing the construction, they need to verify that permeability rate is equal to or uh, greater than what was assumed um, prior to getting an occupancy permit. So rather than have them try to do that and risk some someone's safety prior to, it seems to me that it's a reasonable thing that it's going to be uh, okay. And that if they do it, as long as it's confirmed before they occupy the building, um, I expect it'll be fine. And if that way they can still expand the infiltration area if they need to, to offset any change in the permeability rate that is found to be in place. Okay. And I assume the applicant doesn't have, Marshall, any issues with any of the conditions no, on the groundwater? No, we don't no have we're in agreement. Issues. I'm sorry, who's speaking? Yeah, we're in agreement. We've read them and we agree and concur with Fred. Right. Okay. With Fred's correction that the proposed building is to be connected instead of is not to be connected to the sewer. No. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so then, Fred, turning to your, uh, does anyone uh, on the board have any questions or comments about the groundwater? No. All right. Uh, so, Fred, your town engineer letter. Yes. Putting on a di different hat today. So, um, uh, same hat, basically. <laughs> it's um, so that first item really is the correction that it is to be connected to the town sewer. The plan shows it connected, but the DPW records can't verify that. Um, the other, the next two comments are about the uh, water privilege fee and the sewer privilege fee, which I reviewed with Marshall earlier today, according to the uh, acts of 1975 for both the sewer and the water department, uh, because this is a change of use going from commercial to residential, uh, the betterment as calculated here is what it will be due uh, before they can uh, get going. Um, Conservation Commission approval has already been talked about. The operation and maintenance plan. Um, I had a concern um, on the prior plan, which is why we got a revised one last week, um, that there was some fill in the floodplain that was not being accounted for. Um, in the drainage analysis, uh, the floodplain comes across according to the application and the uh, FEMA maps that 294 and a half um, what our bylaw says is if the engineer provides documentation that there won't be any flooding downstream as a result of fill, um, they can, they can proceed. Uh, what he did was he provided me some additional, uh, he moved it around a little bit, pulled it back a little bit and reduced the fill. And he provided me compensation. There's a, if you look on one of the plans, you'll see, a. 26 yards, uh, cubic yards of compensatory storage at the volume, at the elevation that was being filled uh, in order to compensate that. So there's no net increase in, uh, no net loss in flood storage capacity within that floodplain. And I think it's important to point that out. Okay. Uh, so the only question I had with your letter uh, was number six, um, which was the Verify the turning radius is adequate for the cars existing in the parking space uh, closest to the dumpster. Um, uh, sorry, I, I missed that one. I did have that question. When you look at the plan, the scale they used is um, quite large, makes it easy to see the plan. But I wasn't sure that they applied the turning radius of the vehicle in that last parking space and could it get out and turn around adequately um, without having to make several attempts to do that at that location there. Um, if necessary, I suppose they could slide the dumpster over, although I'm sure they would rather have it as far from the building as possible. But if, they, if they're not able to accommodate the turning radius of that space, 
then they could just slide the dumpster over and then that corner space would be available, be much easier for the car to back into. The radius at this scale looks to be about a five foot radius right there at the corner where the space comes out and goes towards the rain garden. And yeah. I think you need around a 30 foot radius in order to, to make that turn. But if they can put a turning template on there and prove that it works, I'm fine with that. Yeah, we took a quick look at that earlier today and we there's probably three different options or more there. But if we, the dumpster is probably a little larger than it needs to be and the fence enclosure is actually larger than it needs to be now. So we think we could probably reduce both of those and move them to the right but it's probably better in the longer run just to move the dumpster, like you say, swap it to the left, and then the cars have a longer turn to get out. So, so if there happens to be a larger car in that corner space, then he can get out that way. So, yeah. um, but we'll we'll adjust that as needed. But yeah, there's room certainly to put the dumpster and back a car in that corner. That makes sense. That will work for me. I just needed to be very, if they wanted to keep it this way, I needed to verify that would work, but yep. if they're willing to make that change. I'm sure it can be fine. It can be worked yep. out. Just didn't want to see if, because there's only two spaces per unit and one mm. visitor space and inevitably they're almost all going to be full and there's not going to be a place for someone to get out of that one yep. space. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Um, Lori, do you have any um, comments or uh, the one that... thing? Yeah, the one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is in the original submittal, they were requesting a special permit to alter a non-conforming structure. Uh, but when I reviewed the, the site plan, I couldn't see in any way that the building was non-conforming. So I don't think that they need that special permit. So when you look at the draft decision, you'll see that I put in the finding that uh, that special permit is unnecessary. Um, so I am not proposing that you grant that special permit. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? The there is sure. a there is a setback maximum in downtown business of 20 feet, and this building is further than 20 feet back. Does Lori consider that a non-conforming condition? There is a note uh, in the dimensional table that says that the maximum 20 foot setback only applies to new structures. Okay. So because this is a pre-existing structure, it doesn't apply. Thank you. And that sounds good to both the attorney and the applicant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, all right. Uh, are there any other members of the board that have a question at this time. Otherwise, I will open it up to the public. Yeah, Mr. Chair, final question. Uh, yeah, Brad, go ahead. Yeah, Lori, can you please explain why this is a, a conforming structure now? Please, um, or give more detail, if you will. So the lot itself is not conforming. Uh, yeah. for the reasons that Fred stated. So it doesn't meet the minimum lot size requirement for the groundwater protection area, but the building itself is conforming. So this is located in one of our most flexible districts. So the front setback is only six feet and there's no minimum uh, side or rear setback requirement. So they, the building fully complies with the zoning today. So it's not considered a non-conforming structure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Brad. Um, so again, uh, this is a public meeting um, with public input. Um, if you are in the audience uh, and you raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone, um, 
please do so. All right. Someone want to check check me on that? I don't see any hands up right now. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands up either under the okay. attendee tab. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Um, so I think for me, um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of good things uh, with this project, um, but what I would like to see um, is sort of a more defined plan around uh, snow removal. Um, because I do think that because we are building in a wetland area, and this is a very tight lot with groundwater and groundwater two and groundwater three, um, I would like to understand better how the snow is gonna get removed from the site. So I don't know if the applicant wants to make a comment or they need more time to understand. I mean, typically, um, when we typically when we have a, 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 a someone come in, there's a designated area for their snow. Um, you know, even if it's with groundwater, you know, because the, the the idea that <clears throat> you know the whole point is to make this a better site, and <laughs> with the water filtration system, with the rain runoff, like these are all great improvements to the property, except for the snow, right? Mm -hmm. Because someone is just going to push all that snow into the back. Right. And so how do we how do we solve this problem so that the snow isn't an issue, I guess, is my question. Yep. And also, Lori, I see your hand up, Mr. Chair, if I may. Okay. Um, I, I just can't recall any decision that we've made without input from conservation first. Um, I'm not making a motion yet because I want to hear what everyone, the applicant has to say and what Lori has to say. But I, I don't think we should close this hearing tonight. This is my personal opinion. Okay, uh, Lori, I think your hand is up, right? Yeah. Um, so in the draft decision, I included two conditions uh, pertaining to the snow storage. Uh, so the first condition is in letter C, it's Roman numeral eight. And it said that prior to the start of any site work, the applicant shall modify the plan to depict snow storage areas. And then Condition L says that snow shall be piled within snow storage areas only, and no event shall snow be pushed into the rain garden or wetlands. Snow piles shall not exceed eight feet in height, and excess snow shall be disposed of offsite. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the, the clearest answer is that there's just not enough open grassed area on the site that is not a detention basin or rain garden or someplace to put snow. We can't put it anywhere up in the front. So in some respects, it costs more to the applicant to remove snow, but in some respects, it's more environmentally beneficial to a site like this to have it removed. So they would have a plow come in in the morning and push the snow over to one area and they would have a small dump truck come in and they would load it into that dump truck and they would take it off site. Uh, we've got a lot of other sites that are in similar conditions like these little infill sites. Uh, we've actually got a couple parking decks in Westboro that are the same way. They're up on a deck and there's just no place to put it. So they're going to have the same condition. So it's we've had numerous sites where you have that condition, but that that would be what we would suggest. And um, we can provide more detail, but we thought just with the, the way the conditions were listed in here and the fact that that is the plan, I mean, we could certainly, you know, we're not opposed to having Lori add more language in here about any excess would be removed from the site. But uh, that that's generally the plan. Okay, I mean, is there any way to add any sort of uh, into that back area of the parking lot to I don't know, Fred, is there a way to get some sort of a stormwater runoff filtration thing so that we're not just pushing uh, grimy, uh, grimy snow into the, the rain garden and, and wetlands? Well, uh, there is a fence. There's a fence between the rain garden on the south side of the rain garden, so they can't go that far. So right now, the only place they could push it is into that 20 foot by 20 foot deep area that's that's long and then they would come to a fence 
So they really, that would limit how much they can put in there. It's roughly a 20 foot square area. Um, the trouble, the yeah. trouble with snow is that it contains salt and there's no way to keep the salt from getting into the groundwater. And so the best solution is removal from the site. The, you could, if the close, that's why we don't allow it to go into the rain garden or into the detention basins because the salt, this, when the snow melts, it puts all the salt directly into the, the groundwater. And that's something we can't, we can't prevent uh, when it melts. So uh, that's why the snow storage areas are generally outside of the, the drainage system and as far yeah. away as possible. Um, you, you could put it in that place where the turnaround is temporarily in order to hold it and then take it as long as there's curbing around it and then take it off site. Um, it is something that the Conservation Commission usually deals with in their order conditions as well as snow storage. The DEP has a policy on that. The Conservation Commission looks at that pretty closely and I expect that there possibly would be a condition that the snow just be removed from the site. And I could also put in a condition that says that you can't use uh, salt-based snow removal. It has to be potassium chloride or similar. Yep. You, you can, and, and there's, still, there's still snow and stuff that comes onto the site from the cars traveling down the roads around the Commonwealth and snow will eventually get there anyway. Uh, I mean, salt. So, um, so it's a, it's not something it's not something we can completely prevent. We can make those recommendations um, and they're always uh, advised in a groundwater area. <clears throat> but the reality is that salt will still be mixed in with the snow that's in those piles and sand. So hello, I just would like to uh, point out on the planting plan sheet for note number seven, which says that the snow removal maintenance is to be low salt sodium alternative, no phosphorus and sand. That's if you scroll back up to C4. Note number seven on the lower right side. Okay, I see that. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, Brad. So, um, no, sorry. I just wanted. Sorry, I I just want to let you know that there is an attendee with their hand raised. If you just you know. I don't oh, okay. know if I can answer, get to them right now or continue this conversation. I just wanted to throw that out there. I know you got a lot going uh, on. Sure. Yeah. No. Um, does it, I mean, does anyone else from the board uh, have any other questions or comments at this time? Right. So I have a number ends in 760. If you can. Unmute your phone. Hello? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how you doing? This is uh, David Cooley from Blue Water Rental Properties. I also live at 280 West Street and North Pro, and I am also a direct butter. Me and the applicant uh, share property lines in the south of the building. Um, I've been watching the meeting. I think that this is a great project for Northboro. I think that it will definitely enhance the, um, you know, downtown uh, issue that we have with, uh, you know, residential apartments. I also would like to, I see a lot of people talking about, um, you know, the snow removal and going back and forth. Um, I also think that Dunkin' Donuts has a lot tighter of a parking lot and they seem to have no issues with snow plowing and snow removal. Um, I also own a snow business as well. I think that what the applicant has designed 
has plenty enough room in my professional opinion for, you know, parking and storage of snow. Um, but like I said, I'm a supporter of this. I'm a direct of butter. Our property lines um, abut each other. And uh, I hope that the ZBA takes this into consideration with the amount of uh, rental properties that we need in the downtown district and uh, approves this project tonight instead of pushing it off to another meeting. And I also want to say thank you to Fred. Seemed like that was the uh, conversation starter of it. You've done a lot for the town and Marshall as well. And I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you very much, gentlemen, and uh, good luck on your retirement. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. Are there any other members of the board that want to uh, speak? Uh, Marshall, I think you have your hand raised. Yes, I would just like to say um, that we have Sam Lodaf on this Zoom presentation tonight, and I think he would like to just personally introduce himself to you, since he does own multiple properties in Northboro. So if the chair would allow him to just say a few words, please. Sure. Hey, so I'm Sam, and um, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, especially um, Lori, Fred, and Bob for early on when we bought when I bought the property. Uh, they were kind enough to meet with me and just talk it through, and then I met Tom, and and it was a really great approach to the project. Um, I own other property in the town. I've been working on 309 Main Street. Uh, that's our next project. Um, 261 Main, 14 East Main. Um, I'm a good landlord. I'm a good land investor. Uh, I enjoy working in town. Um, and, you know, I'm only a town over, so it's not like I'm a developer who's from far away. Uh, and I'm always available. So um, I want to thank everyone for your time, including Tom, Marshall, and WDA, um, because it, I couldn't do this without the team uh, that I have with me. And uh, all the recommendations that everyone has put forward, I really do appreciate, and I appreciate all of your time. Thanks, Sam. All right, I mean, uh, so is there, I mean, I don't have any other questions or comments on this. Um, you know, I think, um, does anyone else from the board have any comments? Is there a motion? Mr. Chair. Grand. I move that we close the public hearing for 78 West Main Street. I would second the motion. Grand made a motion to close the public hearing and Mark seconded. Uh, roll call vote or any other comments before we take a vote? Nope. All right, uh, Fran? Aye. Uh, Mark? Aye. Susie? Aye. Brad? Nay. Uh, and I am an I. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is the to consider the petition for MBI. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. To consider the petition for MBI Northboro LLC for a special permit to extend a non conforming use and special permit with site plan approval to expand an existing trucking terminal by 12,218 square feet and 20 loading docks and to construct a new 10,780 square foot accessory maintenance facility on the property located at 300 Bartlett Street, map 67, parcel seven in the industrial district. Well, 
All right. Do you know who is going to be speaking? Uh, Peter Ellison. Peter Ellison. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Okay. I just uh, added Peter to the meeting. Good evening, Mr. Chair. How's it going? Okay. Um, if if uh, the board doesn't mind, I also have uh, Jeff Sullivan with me tonight. Um, he represents the uh, the property owner, NBI Northboro LLC. Let me just add him to the panelist. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Evening. Sure can. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, um, again, um, my name is Peter Ellison. I'm the civil engineer for the project representing the, uh, the site owner and the applicant. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, run through a high level presentation of the purpose of the project and what is being proposed. Um, I know that uh, over the last several days, the board has received um, a lot of correspondence from abutters or near neighbors nearby that have concerns about the traffic issue. So I know that's an important issue that we'll get into tonight. So um, with that being said, is it, uh, is it okay if I share my screen, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the project is located at 300 Bartlett Street. Um, it's currently occupied by the FedEx um, freight trucking terminal facility. Um, the, th this kind of phase one of this development was um, approved by the planning board by right in 2011. Um, the building that they elected to build was, is uh, shown here in the center of the site. It's 31,725 square feet uh, and 56 loading docks. Um, now we are in front of you tonight requesting a special permit to extend a non-conforming use. So what that means is between when this project was originally approved and tonight, the zoning bylaw changed, um, and now trucking terminals require, uh, a special permit for a use, um, thus the, the request for a special permit and uh, site plan approval. The purpose of the project that we're in front of you for is to expand this existing trucking terminal use um, by 20 loading docks. I can bring up my site plan here. So the, the expansion of the building is located at the southern end of the existing building. Um, that expansion is 11,206 square feet for the loading docks themselves, uh, as well as a break room pod that's 1,012 square feet. Um, you can kind of see when this first phase of construction was put in place, they had always actually um, accounted for the expansion of the building here to the south. Um, they even went so far as to build the concrete loading pads adjacent to the kind of future expansion. Um, and the final piece of what is being proposed as part of this application is uh, a standalone maintenance shop building that will be 10,780 square feet. Um, there are six overhead doors on each side. Um, and the purpose of this building is to provide maintenance um, and repairs to the existing FedEx fleet of vehicles. So um, it, it was noted in the application, but the purpose of this is, is solely to work on FedEx vehicles. It's not uh, uh, a maintenance shop that would be open to the public. Um, as far as where we stand with, uh, with local permitting, um, I've been, I think I've been to four public meetings, um, two with the design review committee, um, one with the planning board, and uh, I've kicked off the initial presentation to the conservation commission because the, the project does require a land disturbance permit, um, as we'll be altering, uh, I believe, approximately two acres of the existing uh, impervious parking area at the site. Um, that being said, uh, I guess now would be kind of a natural transitioning point where I can start to talk about the traffic, but 
Um, before I do get into that, Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask if you or the board members have any questions about uh, from a high level what's being proposed. Um, Mark, I think I saw your hand raised. Yeah. Um, for that maintenance, is that for local delivery vehicles or for tractor trailer um, long haul? Yeah, this is the freight facility. So um, most of the vehicles that are currently using this facility are um, tractor trailers and uh, they call them pup vehicles. Um, it's like a single unit truck, essentially. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, I don't Mr. see anyone Chair, else with it. I have, I have uh, a question yep. about the maintenance as well. What kind of maintenance yep. would be done on those vehicles? Is it standard? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's uh, pretty standard maintenance type items. You know, these these vehicles are these are freight freight trucking vehicles, so they they do get a lot of mileage on them. Um, so you you would see you know things ranging from a standard like oil change to just any kind of you know maintenance repairs if their maintenance like maintenance lights come on. Um, that would all be kind of like within the realm of uh, the maintenance shop. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Susie, or anyone else at the board? I mean, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions, so um, you might as well just get into the traffic study at this point. Okay. Sounds good. So as part of our, uh, our application, TEC performed a traffic analysis and traffic study, and we focused on two um, intersections. First was the intersection of Bartlett Street, and there's a shared driveway here that's used by both uh, 330, 350, which are the Amazon buildings, and then our, our site, which is 300, which is the FedEx building. So we studied this intersection, and then we studied um, secondarily the interior intersection here, um, which are pretty much solely used by FedEx and Amazon. Um, what I'd like to start with is, is um, some good news. Uh, the the Intersection here with Bartlett Street and the site driveway um, is laid out. It is functioning as a safe intersection. Um, we looked back at the past five years. There's only been one reported accident at this intersection. Um, part of our review when we look at these intersections is to make sure that there's adequate sight distance and sight lines in both directions. Um, this intersection far exceeds uh, all of the minimum thresholds for site and safety analysis. Um, and secondarily, the overall capacity of this intersection, you know, it's currently under stop control here. There's um, a single left turn lane out and a single right turn lane out onto Bartlett Street. Um, the capacity of this intersection is well below the, um, the what we call 1.0, which is the kind of like the maximum capacity of the intersection. We're, we're far below that. Um, based off of, we look at a seven year horizon, a build horizon where we include trips um, with a growth factor from our site, from just um, industry standard growth factors, and then any nearby projects that have been approved by the town of Northboro or Marlboro in this case. Um, and you know the, the, those projects that haven't been constructed yet, and even when we factor in all of those trips, uh, this intersection still operates at a, an acceptable level of service. Um, essentially what we found in our analysis is that uh, Bartlett Street is free flowing, um, even in the 2030 build analysis. Um, and the expansion of our site will basically have zero impact to traffic flow on Bartlett Street. Um, now, I, I know the, the kind of hot topic, and this is something that has come up um, at just, I think, every meeting that we've been to thus far. And uh, obviously, the board is probably aware of the nearby residents that live, you know, in between where our site is located and Route 20, um, specifically, you know, in this neighborhood and, and uh, near the high school property. So um, I think... What we found with our study is um, 
that we, we essentially, we agree with these residents. Um, they've pointed out that there is quite a bit of heavy truck traffic that is driving along Bartlett street and, and by their neighborhoods. Um, and I think if, if we dive into the data of what our study shows, um, we agree. Um, and I think, you know, what's important to note here is that our traffic study shows that the trucks that are coming to and from the FedEx and Amazon site, because we're looking at this driveway as a whole is extremely low in comparison to the total number of trucks that are on Bartlett street. Um, what we've discussed with the other board design review and with the planning board thus far has been that they would like um, additional or improved signage at this, at this driveway to uh, further prevent trucks from turning left onto Bartlett Street. Um, and that's something that we absolutely agree with and, and um, agree to provide as part of the project. Um, and secondarily, um, in addition to the signage, you know, the, the condition of the approval would be that the FedEx facility itself would agree to no left turns for trucks coming out of the site um, and to provide, you know, on-site training to its truck drivers um, as part of their operations so that the, the truck drivers that are coming and going from this freight facility are aware of that issue and know that they need to avoid uh, that stretch of Bartlett Street. Right. Essentially, the only way to access this site will be Bartlett Street from the east, from Marlboro. Uh, and the only way to exit the site would be Bartlett Street to the east, take a right out of the site and go out to uh, towards Marlboro. Um, that being said, well, I, I guess I'll just, I'll stop there um, and I'll turn it back over to the board um, and see if there are any follow-up questions. Thank you. I guess the first question is, how do you prevent trucks coming in from the West? So, interestingly, um, you know, like I said, there is quite a bit of truck traffic on Bartlett Street from the West. Um, what we found is that, realistically, those trucks are not coming into our site. I think as part of, and, and I'm not sure if this board was involved with the approval of the Amazon facilities, I'm guessing it was, um, but I believe that those facilities already have a turn restriction in place. Um, but essentially what we found is that there were 65 total, you know, we, we performed the traffic movement count at this intersection. We looked at two hours in the morning from seven to nine, and then two hours in the afternoon from four to six. Um, there were, 65 total trucks during that time period that came into the site, um, nine of them came from the West. So the answer is it's not zero. And that's what the data shows. There are some, it's a, it's a relatively low number in comparison, but um, you know, it's, it's not zero. Um, so that, I guess that kind of answers your question. Um, how to prevent it is kind of a separate issue. Um, one thing that has been recommended, I think by, by Laurie Connors in her memo to the board was to implement some physical changes at this intersection. So we could, you know, there's an opportunity here to tighten up the radius of this curb, add some physical improvements with granite curbing in the center here to make it physically impossible for trucks to turn right into the site. Um, that is something that in, at, you know, in a, as a principle, the owner of this site does not oppose doing that. Um, where it gets complicated for us is that this driveway is, this is a shared driveway and the actual physical location of this driveway is not on FedEx's property. It's actually, you know, a portion of it is in the right of way of Bartlett street. And then the majority of the approach to the intersection is on uh, the 350 Bartlett Street property. Um, so I, I did see that that was a recommend recommendation from Lori's, uh, in Lori's memo. And again, I just wanna say that that's not something that we oppose in principle. Um, it's just, we can't 
it's not something that we can agree to right now because it's out of our control. Um, that, that driveway is physically located on a, on a separate property. Right. So basically you would need to get permission from the other property that if this was a condition, it would, they would allow it. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. I guess then can, can we walk through um, the numbers of the traffic study? Sure. In all, all of its detail, please. So, you know, basically let's start at a high level, right? How many trucks are, are coming in from the east and the west on a daily basis? How many trucks are going into FedEx versus Amazon? Um, how many trucks are leaving it uh, and making lefts and making rights on a daily basis to set sort of the baseline? Um, and then we can go with sort of your model for projecting what the expansion would mean in terms of additional truck traffic. Um, and then, you know, sort of just go from there. So in all its uh, beautiful numbers detail. Yeah, cool. sounds good. So um, this is a this is a page from our. What I've done is I've I've extracted two pages from our churning movement count that was done by Precision, Precision Data Industries, which is like a third party uh, traffic counting um, subcontractor. This page that I've pulled out here is uh, the morning two hour study that was done on Thursday, March thirtieth, um, and it's specifically for heavy vehicles. So let's start with, let's start with uh, trucks that are leaving our site. So in the morning, trucks that are leaving our site and turning left, which is the one that, you know, I think is the most important to the board and to the residents. Um, we show that there are four total in that two hour period. Um, and trucks that are leaving the site from the south and turning right is, uh, is 41. So there's 45 total trucks leaving the site. Uh, 41 of them are, are currently turning right, and four of them are, are turning left out of the site. Um, I think we should probably just stick with that same movement here and look at the afternoon period. Um, again, trucks that are leaving the site turning left is, this is from 4 to 6 p.m. That's uh, two total trucks. And then trucks that are leaving the site and turning right is uh, 12. So four, 14 total trucks leaving, um, 12 of them are turning right out of the site. Right. Sorry, how many turning left on that one? You said three? Uh, in the afternoon, two total trucks turned left in our, uh, in our study period. So do you have, do you have daily numbers? Um, we do have daily numbers. We, we, um, you know, when we look at these intersections and do turning movement counts, um, what we do is we focus on the peak hours of traffic because typically, typically the heavy traffic numbers are, are happening in that morning and afternoon commute period. Um, but we, we do have some overall um, daytime numbers that uh, are interior to the site. So as far as turning movement counts, what we're looking at is 7 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, I mean, the facility does run 24 hours a day, right? I mean, you, you're FedEx, you're a big freight operator. You got 18 wheelers coming in there from... Maine, New Jersey, all over the place, right? Coming in at two in the morning, three in the morning, right? So it's not like, you know, I understand the morning and afternoon is good, but like, do you have the full day of traffic numbers? Yep, we do. Okay. The, uh, the overall traffic numbers are, so what, what's currently being generated by the site is 394 total trips. And with the expansion of the site, that would be increased by 169 total trips to 563. Okay. So do you have turning counts for uh, 394? Uh, no, we don't. We have, we have turning counts for the, uh, the two hour periods in the morning and in the afternoon.
Um, so I think, I mean, is, is it, you know, looking at this, you know, the, the Amazon facility, right, obviously has a restriction in place to only make left-hand turns, right? But it is safe to say that they don't always follow the proper protocol. Only make right-hand turns, I think. Right-hand right turns, all. It, oh, only making right, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I guess then the question is. Um, one, one thing I do want to just respond to, Mr. Chairman, there. Um, sure. The numbers that I just presented to you as far as, you know, left and rights does not differentiate between FedEx and Amazon. It's just looking at it as a whole, that, that, drive, that driveway as a whole. Okay, so the 41 and four could be all FedEx making the left-hand turn or all Amazon. Is that, you guys were not identifying the trucks? Uh, I guess no, I mean, the, the way that these traffic counts are performed is more, um, they're performed by cameras. So they don't, they wouldn't be able to differentiate between uh, an Amazon truck from a, from a FedEx truck. We did do, um, we did do ATR counts, which are just, you know, the tubes that go down on the pavement. And we looked at, um, you know, rough numbers from the Amazon driveway versus the FedEx driveway. So we could give you like a general percentage. Um, but but I, I don't, I, these, these counts are not able to differentiate between a FedEx truck and an Amazon truck. Okay. So, so I guess like I'm looking at sort of this, it's uh sorry, it's the figure three in the engineering corp thing. It's got the little arrows. It's got pictures on it. So I like it more. Um, so I just want to understand how this Yep, that's the one, right? So on the bottom for the weekday evening commutes, right? What this is telling me is that there are six trucks coming from the FedEx driveway and there are 62 trucks coming from the Amazon facility, right? That are leaving sort of those two driveways. And then when they get to that driveway, 35 are making lefts and 28 are making rights. Yeah, but the, uh, in general, these figures are combined numbers. So these are cars plus trucks. Okay. And um, as part of, you know, as part of our analysis and what our goal is, is this number here, the 35 taking a left onto Bartlett. Our model is that that is 35 passenger cars. That's how we've modeled this. So we're, we are making the assumption and what we are trying to achieve with the, with the study is to make sure that all of the rights, you know, the truck numbers that we're counting on are taking the right onto Bartlett Street. Okay. Um, Susie, you have a question? Ryan had her hand up, but it's not really a oh, question. Sorry. So I'm, I'm just going to, I just want to say a fact quick, um, sure. just because it has to do with the, the turns and then I'll let Fran go because I know she's had her hand up longer. I just want to point out, and it doesn't have to do with the residents, but it has to do with that, the school and the high school students. I did a little fact finding myself. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, school safety and traffic safety and kid safety in this town. And Algonquin, Algonquin Regional High School recently had a school start leader initiative start. So they now start at 8 a.m. Um, and they, the, the end date for the school day is 2.30. Many stay later for after school activities such as drama, sports, et cetera, et cetera. However, at this age, they can drive. So we have the most inexperienced drivers, um, going to Algonquin and the school issues 200 to 300 parking passes um, for these drivers. So if they have a license, they can apply and get one. Um, and I did call the office. And when I told them who I was, um, I was quickly rushed up straight to the assistant principal for these numbers. So I just wanted to point that out that it's not just a residence and, you know, everybody else, but it, it is a school safety 
issue about the most inexperienced drivers that are on the road when they're making these wrong hand turns during their rush hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Susie. Uh, Fran, you had your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see you. I apologize. Oh, no problem at all. Um, I just have a quick question specific um, to the left-hand turn, um, the few that were counted during these four hours. Um, you did not follow them to see that they also made lefts on to Lyman Street and never actually went into our residential area, did you? No, we did not. Okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mark. Yeah. Um, about that, is there any regular traffic between this facility and the one down Lineman Street? Is there any cross traffic between your two facilities? <laughs> um, I'm sure that there is some, but it's they do operate. Uh, they do operate independently, so um, it's not like there are daily scheduled deliveries that go from you know the freight to the to the ground facility down the street. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair? Uh, are there any other, uh, Brad, yes. Yeah, so this is a question for Bob. So Bob, I know some of the other distribution centers have the conditions slash restrictions on no left turns or if you're across the street from this facility, no right turn uh, towards Bartlett. Um, I, I don't expect you to know this off the top of your head, Bob, but how many times have these trucks violated it and how many, I mean, or how many times have they been fined? I guess you can say, because we put a condition on these guys, like, I mean, it's going to be tough to enforce. So I, I'm kind of curious. Um, I have fined nobody. Okay. Okay. One of the, but I have received several complaints about trucks going on Bartlett Street. The situation is this. Mm -hmm. If somebody is going down Bartlett Street, I cannot determine from the photograph or the evidence that's given to me whether they have come all the way down Bartlett Street out of Marlboro or if they've turned off of Lyman Street, okay? Yep. So the only way for me to really enforce anything is for somebody to hand me evidence where we can actually see the vehicle leaving the driveway entering onto Bartlett Street okay in motion mm -hmm. and I have to be able to see the area of the town where they are okay if I have a picture you know of a truck heading the wrong way in front of a high school entrance that doesn't do any good you cannot you cannot prove um, where that truck came from you know, that's that that's that's been the issue Ever since we've had, um, you know, uh, Amazon come in and, and, and all of the people complaining that, you know, the trucks are going in the wrong direction. And I've explained that to people. I said, I need to have something where the vehicle is actually leaving the driveway in the wrong direction. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I just want to, um, this question is for Lori, uh, just real quick. Um, so as we were going through this case, and Laura, I just want you to confirm in terms of the extending uh, of a non-conforming use, right? So just to remind the board. So this is a special permit for extension of a non-conforming use, right? But we should be using section 7-08020A um, with sort of the three criteria um, in, in terms of the, looking at this case. Uh, and so I'll just read what those sort of are. Uh, will the extension be for a similar or less non-conforming use is one. Two, will the extension be substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming use is to the neighborhood? And then the third one is, will the extension be different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or on the property in the vicinity? So I just want this just to remind the board that that's sort of the perspective we should be looking at um, when thinking about this case. Um, you know, going forward. Uh, Mark, I think you, yeah. I believe you had your hand raised. Um, yeah. yeah, as far as restrictions on the entrance here for uh, either coming in from the West or going to the West, um, is this okay with 
do we in the does our fire department support this building and would the fire department be okay with those restrictions on entrance and exit uh, would that impair their servicing of this area in case of fire so what i suggest um, is that they propose some physical Im improvements to the driveway and then I'd like to march that proposal in front of the fire chief uh, to see what he thinks of it. Um, if you look at the current configuration of the driveway, there's one lane, um, there you go, on one side, and then there's a kind of, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the word, um, but there's, a uh, there's rumble, rumble, rumble strip. strip. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> There's a rumble strip, a concrete rumble strip uh, that divides that one lane from the balance of the driveway. Mm -hmm. So I would suspect if that were raised um, and vertical granite curb put around it, then any fire truck that's interested in going into the facility at a high speed would simply have to go on the other side and they'd be able to make the, the corner just fine. Um, so you can see that there are two very large lanes on the opposite side of the rumble strip. So they'd have their sirens going. So I, I can't imagine that there would be a, um, a safety issue by them going around the rumble strip for that, that small distance. And so Lori, you don't believe that the raised uh, curb will impact trucks coming in from the left, I mean, the uh, east? No, because of, so you have a significant, um, amount of area. So right now they're already, I mean, of course they have to propose the changes. So we haven't seen yep. any changes yet. Uh, yep. So it all depends on the configuration that they're proposing. But I would imagine that they would ensure that the tractor trailers are gonna be able to make that turn from the mm -hmm. east um, and be able to get in fine. So the problem would be for them to make the turn from the west. Okay. Okay. Um, and I guess, Peter, like, just in terms of the configuration for the proposal, like, obviously, you guys, you know, I think you had mentioned earlier, I mean, you guys are fine with sort of trying to come up with what that would potentially look like in doing the analysis there. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, I think the way that Lori just described it um, is achievable to create a raised curb island in the center that would prohibit large trucks from turning left here and yep. tightening this radius up enough to prevent tr large trucks from turning right in, um, but also leaving enough room for a truck to turn left into the site. I think that is achievable and something that we can work on, um, on developing and presenting to the board. You know, just, I just wanted to raise the point like I said earlier, that it, it would be something that is subject to review by the, uh, you know, by the Amazon, the, the owner of the Amazon site as well. Okay, you got it. Uh, Fran, I, I think I saw your hand up. Um, uh, well, part of my question was answered. I just want confirmation that this raised curbing would um, deter left turns going out of the driveway in as much as I don't know what happens if somebody comes down Lyman Street and then wants to make a right. I guess they have to go down into Marlboro and turn around or something, but the going left was my concern. Um, I do just wanna ask if our town engineer and or the applicant, a lot of the letters that we receive from people keep implying that the further down Bartlett Street is not a safe road, is not a road that was meant for heavy trucks. And I just wanna confirm from the engineering standpoint that it is an actual road that, I mean, is this a perception or is there some technical or material reason why people believe the road itself was not meant for truck traffic or do they mean 
or is there thought is it's not meant for residential, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can I can uh, speak to this. So in, in general, I think Bartlett Street, um, the width is adequate for trucks. Um, the problem the problem is just from a perception standpoint, um, heavy industrial uses and residential uses and school uses do not mix. So, you know, again, we we understand what um, what the abutters and the residents, you know, how they feel about this. Um, and, and we don't disagree. So, you know, I think our perspective on it is, you know, what can, what can we control um, on, this, on this development to try and improve the current condition? Um, you know, we, we can agree to provide training to the employees to make sure that they're turning right and, and not coming from the West. Um, we can agree to the turning restriction um, where I, I don't believe that the FedEx facility currently operates with a turning restriction because it predates um, really the, the origin of these, these kind of issues on, out there. Um, and third, you know, we can agree to try and provide physical improvements to further, um, further, you know, make it impossible, I guess, is the way to say it, for trucks to turn left out of here. Um, and as far as, you know, trucks that are trying to access the site from the West, you know, if, if they get here and there's signage and they're not able to turn into the site, um, that will be something that they remember the next time that they try to access the site. So, you know, I, I do think it's a good idea. Um, you know, the trouble is that we, we just don't own this piece of land where the driveway is located. So, we're trying to do the right thing and work with, you know, the, the board and the town and the abutters. And um, ho hopefully it's something that we can, we can provide to provide an improvement. Thank you. I guess, Fred, did you have any, or, or Bob, um, comment on the width of Marlott Street? I think some of the issue, um, so obviously, directly in front of the the site um you know there are it's the width of a road plus there's several feet on either side for you know vehicles to pull over and the like so <clears throat> it's wide enough but i think as you get closer to the high school uh whether it's you know just past lyman uh maple street hemlock drive like that's where the road narrows and i feel like that's where some of the you know, concern is there um, in terms of the width. So is there a standard or anything? Um, I guess I would have to agree with Peter that it's more of a perception issue. I think as you go down, I don't know the exact pavement width um, in the area between Hemlock and Route 20 uh, versus the pavement width. It is more open, there are less trees in the area between Lyman and uh, the site. Um, there are more trees if you go uh, further to the east. Um, and so it, it gives more of a constrained appearance. I, I would agree, I think it's more of a perception issue that there's more, it's more difficult for trucks and they shouldn't be in the area in that portion of Bartlett Street. But I think that the, the, dry, the pavement is adequate for trucks in that area as well as this area. Um, but I don't have the exact number on the pavement width at each of those locations. Um, are there any other members from the board? So I, I feel like, you know, we definitely have some takeaways. Um, I would imagine that this hearing does get continued to the next meeting um, with some homework for FedEx. Um, is there anyone else from the board that has questions, uh, Susie? Um, I really appreciate the, the fact that the applicant wants to make all of these changes and everything um, and is willing to um, try to do the, think it's gonna be feasible with the, um, with the other, is it an, another tenant or is it an owner that you share the driveway with? 
Yeah, the that you would uh, have the, to approach the the um, Amazon parcels are under a separate ownership. Okay. I mean, because I, I, I do appreciate it. I, I know that the residents are, um, you know, they're very concerned. And as I said, as a, um, you know, as someone who sees the high school students go in and out of there um, on a regular basis, you just, you can't help but be concerned as well. But um, I do appreciate that you came here willing and with ideas and open to listening. And so thank you on that. So, Mr. Chair, uh, can I just ask, because I mean, the, there are a lot of other things, not just the traffic about this. Um, the planning board did um, put together very thorough technical um, considerations, the design review as well. Would we want to table all that until we do come back? Or do we want to go through those? Um... Paul, you're muted. Sorry, I was talking to myself there for about 30 seconds. Um, yeah, so uh, we can go through the planning board uh, letter and the design review now, if that, if that works. And my thought process was just that if we're going to have them come back, they might as well have every anything that anything outstanding could be addressed in at the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to lead the discussion here and just run through these comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could start with, um, or, or I see Lori's got the planning director questions up, but um, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we want to look at the design review committee suggestions for. The arbor bodies for the screening, the new lights, um, you know, what we're talking about prohibiting the left turn, the signage to the drivers, turn right, um, repairing the current sign. Um, you know, I assume that these are all acceptable. Yeah, sure. So um, in general, from a high level, yes. Um, there really wasn't anything in here that we um, took exception with as far as these comments go. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just, I'll start with Laura's letter here and then we can work our way through um, all of the kind of advisory letters that the board's received to date. Um, so this first one is related to the traffic report. So I won't spend much time on it because we've talked quite a bit about it, but um, at the bottom here, um, there was a question. We, we had a typo in our report where we labeled the, um, the building at 301 Bartlett Street to be two and a half miles west of the site driveway, where in reality, it's um, just 0.3 miles from the driveway. Um, that was just a typo. The, the numbers that were associated with that development are all included with the um, with our model. So that, that wouldn't have any impact on the analysis itself. Um, This second comment is is um, related to the physical adjustments to the to the um, driveways intersection. So I think we've spent enough time on that. We're kind of in agreement with the with the one you know exception or comment being that we need to approach um, a separate property owner in order to accomplish that. Um, comment number three is related to the total parking spaces at the site. Um, I believe what's required by zoning is like 70 spaces total and, and what's being provided is um, over 400. I, I believe the correct number is the middle is the 436, um, but that's something that we can absolutely just, you know, re double check our count and submit a revised site plan that shows it appropriately. Um, number four is related to the landscaping. Um, so we would, we would be fine with adding a note that says all of the Arborvitae proposed um, should be a minimum of six feet tall. Um, and I can show the board exactly where that is being proposed. So the, this is the uh, Northern edge of the existing FedEx um, 
parking lot. Part of the discussion with the design review committee was that um, the view from Bartlett Street, as you look up to the site, there's quite a bit of topography that goes up to the site, um, but you can kind of see the very top of the existing fuel station out there. So the, the committee had recommended adding some um, green screening, I would call it. Um, so arborvitae trees along this edge so that as you drive by on Bartlett Street, you kind of, you know, we, we would provide that, that green screen and arborvitae mm -hmm. screen between Bartlett Street and uh, the proposed improvements essentially. Um, number five is the site plan should be noted. This is a question about snow storage. Um, the good news here on this site is that there is plenty of space for snow storage. Um, we've already kind of taken a look at pulling together, together some calculations for how much snow storage is required for the overall parking lot. Um, and that's something that I can, I can formally submit to the board following tonight's hearing, but um, we've essentially bubbled in this area at the bottom of the page here. It's about 500 feet wide by uh, 500 feet long by 50 feet wide. Um, because of the, the excess of parking that is available at the site, we'll, what the, you know, what the current operations do is essentially they plow the existing pavement into large snow stockpiles at the rear of the site um, where it can kind of slowly melt and work its way into the stormwater system for treatment. <clears throat> So that's kind of the area that we um, are showing toward the, the south of the development here. Um, this area is for a, a pretty large storm. I believe what we ran with was 20 inches of snow. Um, so there's, there's plenty of room for, uh, for snow storage at the site. Uh, this, the site plan should denote the location of road salt storage and associated enclosure. Um, that's something that we can add to the site plan. It, it's just something that we need to, um, you know, run by FedEx and, and confirm exactly where they do want that. But the, uh, the lighting on the site is something I'm glad that we're able to talk about. Um, like I said, this development was the first phase of this development was put in um, about 10 years ago. 10 to 12 years ago, um, <clears throat> there are, let me just bring up the plans. At the time that the development was put together, there was a photometric plan um, in place. There are 40 foot light poles out there. The lights are all pointed down at the pavement. Um, as you can see, the light poles here kind of are situated toward the exterior of the parking lot. And then there are certain areas where there are poles interior to the lot and then building, mount, building mounted lights um, above the loading docks. So the expansion kind of carries the same uh, style and general location of the lights. So these, these building mounted lights would, you know, be added to the expanded building. And similarly, you know, building mounted lights are proposed on the, um, on the maintenance building. Um, but overall, because the footprint of the development is relatively small within the parking lot, what we're proposing to do is retain these existing lights. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something that I would like to get some feedback from the board on tonight is um, the way that Lori writes the comment here, um, I think is we're, we are amenable to that. Um, you know, she's essentially, she's saying, she, the applicant should address whether shields can be added to the existing lights closest to the west property line, which is over by A. Dewey Pile, um, to eliminate or minimize the alleged reflection of light on Bartlett Pond. Um, that was a comment that came up as part of our review with uh, the de design review committee. Um, again, I just want to state that, you know, uh, at the time that this was built, the there was a photometric plan in place that shows that there's no light pollution. Uh, there's no light actually leaving the site. However, because of where this property is situated, the topography of the site, these poles are actually visible from Bartlett Pond. Um, so um, I forget the gentleman's name on the, on the committee that brought this up, but he had a good point that at 
at nighttime, you can see, um, I guess you would call it glare off the water of Bartlett Pond. You can kind of see these lights off in the distance. Um, so I think in general, the owner is willing to upgrade these lights along the Western edge here and retrofit these with shielding. Um, I did see a separate condition that would include, that would require that all lights be dark sky compliant. Um, and that, that would, you know, that would be a kind of a big ask um, because we are proposing to retain all of these light poles. Um, it's unclear because these are 12 years old if they were dark sky compliant at the time that they were built. So I guess a question that I have for the board is, you know, is the board okay with us upgrading these lights along the Western edge? These are the ones that are visible from, from pretty far away. Um, and we kind of agree, like it makes sense. We can add shielding to these um, pretty easily. Um, but if possible, we would, we would like to avoid the requirement to upgrade, you know, all of the lights at the site to be dark sky compliant. Sorry, can, can I ask why? Is it costing? Yeah, it would be a, it would be a heavy it would be a pretty big cost to uh, pull down. You know, I think there's probably 25 light poles across the site and upgrade them all. Lori, I mean, the, the purpose of the shield is to keep the light on the property, right? Yeah, so what the shield would do is it would um, be applied to the back of the light so that it would prevent uh, the <clears throat> light from uh, extending over into the, um, the edge of the parking lot. So it would just be directed into the parking lot itself. So it would be, it would be like a metal piece that extends down uh, below the light. That's my understanding. Yeah, and, and again, I just wanna say that we, we agree it makes sense for these lights that are at the Western edge, the ones that are visible, you know, from the re residential and Bartlett Pond area, pretty far away. I think it's like over 3000 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, but adding shielding to these interior light poles um, would cause gaps of lighting in the paved areas. And, you know, being a, being a heavy trucking facility, like that's just not gonna be accept an acceptable um, condition, you know, from a safety perspective, it needs to be well lit. All right, I guess you have one of those uh photometric plans that shows how far the lights go and stuff? Yep. Or do we? That's what he's cut up right now. It's just really hard to see. Yeah, so this, this was submitted and attached as an attachment to our, um, our application with the board. And what we're proposing is, again, is just to retain all of the existing light poles around the site. Um, and the only new lights that are being proposed are the ones that are physically attached to the loading docks and to the, uh, to the maintenance building itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, And I, I think uh, I think it's important to note the context of like how this how this comment kind of came to be and, and arose. I I don't think that the gentleman who raised this this issue ever um, was trying to say that there is light leaving the property. I think it was just you know because of the topography and the location of this site um, with the poles being fairly tall at forty feet, um, you can see the lights from pretty far away. Is is essentially the uh, how the comment came up. Okay. 
I, I, I think we um, we can take that back as feedback. Okay. And Lori, we, we can we can figure that out. That was with the design review comments. Uh, it, it was in uh, it was in both Lori's letter and the uh, design review comments as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is a public hearing. Does anyone else on the board have a any comments? Um, let's see. So uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, if you are in the audience, um, please raise your hand uh, to speak, or if you're on the phone, please dial uh, star nine. All right, uh, Rachel. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Hi. Rachel, how are you? Good, how are you? It's Rachel Armstrong, 10 uh, Hemlock Drive. Um, I have a couple of points and a question. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, FedEx engineer, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, um, for helping us try to enforce the turning direction. Um, as Bob mentioned, it's extremely difficult to enforce. So. Um, having some sort of structure there would be very helpful. Um, the other point I wanted to make was a couple of people had said something about the perception of residents on the residential part of Bartlett Street. It's not a perception. We had a traffic study done by the CMRPC a few years ago. We have twice what we need for a truck exclusion on that residential section, and we can't get it because we would need permission from Marlboro. So that's not perception, that's reality, that's clear, concrete data. A truck exclusion would be a safety measure that we can't get. So um, obviously there's some safety issues there. Um, the In the same CMRPC meeting, the police chief talked about not being able to pull cars over in that section because it's so narrow. So you can imagine when you have a tractor trailer and a school bus trying to maneuver if something goes wrong, how dangerous the, the situation could be. Um, I would also like, um, if you haven't, to maybe spend some time at the light at Bartlett and Route 20 and, and watch a truck make a, the turn from Route 20 onto Bartlett Street and see how harrowing it is when the truck comes on the wrong side of the road on the side that you're on and it's facing you head on. Um, we have several videos of this. I'm happy to forward them to you guys if you don't want to sit at the let yourselves. So um, this is not perception. This is our daily reality. Um, the last point I have is a question. Um, it had come up about the warehouse off of Lyman Street, the other FedEx warehouse. What are the plans for that warehouse? I know FedEx is merging their operations nationally. Is that warehouse going away? Is the expansion to merge those two facilities or will we also have their, that warehouse in addition to this potentially expanded warehouse? That's it, those are my issues. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can respond to the question about the uh, the other FedEx facility if you'd like. Uh, sure, yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Um, so I think in general, you know, my company, TEC, we work for the owner of the site where, where FedEx Freight is located. Um, we, we don't work directly for FedEx, um, though they are the tenant of this property. Um, as far as we know, there is no proposed change you know, we don't have any knowledge beyond what's being proposed on this site plan um, for, for what's happening with that other facility. So I, I just can't, I don't yep. have any, any uh, other knowledge on that. The only thing I would add to that, Peter, and I'll go back uh, on mute, is despite being FedEx, these um, silos operate very independent of one another. So FedEx freight here, is even the guys on site may not know much about what's going on on that other site. So, yep. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Um, so I I see a uh, attorney Robin Manning. Oh, 
Hello, Robin, if you could just unmute. Yep, I did that. Can you hey, hear me? Uh, hi. Yes, Robin, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, so thank you, FedEx, for agreeing that um, there really should be no trucks going down Bartlett Street. I'm up, um, at 46 Bartlett Street. Um, I've been here since um, for many years. Um, I just want to emphasize um, that I take offense to the, you know, the comment about um, the perception of residents because that that's just, it's offensive to have someone say that. Um, for starters, the road <laughs> is 100% narrow uh, from Route 20 to at least the high school. My driveway on my side of the street, um, I don't have a sidewalk. So my driveway goes right to the street. So if my child, I have three sons, is waiting for the bus, he is a, when he stands at the end of our driveway, he's a foot away from the street. Now, I don't know what the white line is called, you know, on either side of the road, but there is probably six, maybe 12 inches from that white line to my, the end of my driveway. Okay. So what that means is, is my son is waiting at the end of my driveway for the bus. And if a tractor trailer goes by, it is probably a foot away from my son. If he's at the end of the driveway, it's, I can't express to you the danger of trucks going down the street and how narrow it is, okay? Now, keep in mind, there are children constantly riding bikes to and fro to go fishing, to go to the high school. I mean, children of all ages, from age seven to 18, there are adults driving their bikes on Bartlett Street. I'm sure if you've been on Bartlett Street, there's always a biker going by. Every time I pull out of my driveway, there's a biker going by. Um, from Bartlett Street, the corner, and Route 20, there are there are no sidewalks on either um, side of Bartlett Street. At the end there, there it, it stops, actually, right at Route 20. And there are um, two plazas. There are pizza places, two of them. There's a driving school for you know, kids to get their license and the kids, you know, they're going back and forth swarms of kids every day going to their driving lessons. So as Rachel, um, the previous speaker just said, when trucks are going, taking a right from route 20 onto Bartlett street, and they have taken out signs, they have taken out the curb. I mean, it's been overhauled so many times. Um, it's, it's just incredible taking either a right or even a left onto Bartlett Street is incredibly dangerous. My, my thought is, and I'm not sure why this was never done, we have accommodated trucks to get onto Bartlett Street. Instead of keeping the corners the way they were, we have widened them. We don't have um, sidewalks on those corners. There's not even if you cross. So if kids are coming from the high school, there's not a sidewalk. They are in the streets and on the grass. They they can press a button to cross the street, but there really isn't a crosswalk there. They walk onto the other side. It's kind of hard to explain, but they go from the east side of Bartlett Street to the west side of Bartlett Street. And there are no crosswalks. There's no sidewalks. Um, that we have literally made it so more dangerous by widening the corner, uh, the west side corner of Bartlett and Route 20. Um, you know, perhaps FedEx could contribute to making a sidewalk there at the corner and and make, putting it back to the way it used to be, maybe a couple of feet out so that it's not easy for trucks to turn down there. Perhaps have a sign um, at the end of Bartlett Street showing trucks should go, continue on Route 20 and take a right of whatever that is, Forest Street, 
to get to FedEx. Um, you know, that is a thought that is doable. That'll help the, the trucks coming from 290 or Route 20 West or um, even uh, coming from Route 20 East, which I see. I mean, I live here. I am driving up and down Main Street and Bartlett Street 20 times a day. And this is what I see. And on that point, I will say, excuse me. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. If you, are you, if you could just uh, um, do you have any other points to make? Yep, I do. The other points okay. are that um, the, the numbers of the, tra- the trucks that are going by, they're, yep. they're pulling down Route 20, uh, Bartlett Street. Um, just as much as they're pulling out of. Okay, so the whole numbers um, that FedEx has come up with in the two hour period, I mean, I'm not sure if it's really helpful, um, you know, with all the, this trying to figure out a traffic study. It's not, to me, it's not helpful, the two hour periods and whatnot. I, I'm glad to hear that there are less um, trucks taking a left. Um, that being said, I think everybody knows how dangerous it is having the trucks and I'm glad FedEx you're on board to do things about it. The other question is you did the tube traffic study showing um, the total amount of trucks. I'd really like to know more about that um, information and the numbers on that just to get totals. Um, And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. I appreciate it. Um, so next I have, uh, uh, yeah, friend, Uh, uh, because I I would just like to say, um, since I asked the question about the road, I just wanted to assure Miss Manning and the other caller that I was not trying to insult or imply that they were not being genuine in their concerns. I was specifically asking, because I am not a, an engineer or a traffic study person, was the letters all, in, all the letters that were written had very similar language about the narrowing of the road in a residential area. And I was looking for a technical answer to that question. It was not meant as an insult to the residents. Thank you. Okay, thanks Ryan. Uh, so there's a um, phone number star or three seven six to um, who called in. If you could just please state your name uh, and your address. Hello. Seven seven four ends with three seven six. Looks like you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, Mute now, off of mute. Hello? All right, uh, we will come back to 376. Um, There is someone named uh, Cal. If you could just please state your name or unmute, state your name and your address, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Khan at the Five Star Book Play. I uh, just want to uh, second uh, all the previous speakers have said about the narrowing of lanes and the turns from Route 20. Uh, beyond that, of course, uh, uh, if I heard the numbers correctly, uh, uh, FedEx stated that traffic would increase by 40%. Is that right? Uh, the increase, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, would be 169 trucks. Uh, in and out, where there's currently 394. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that's that's about 40 so, percent increase in uh, volume. Is that correct? Yeah. That's about 42 okay. percent. Yeah. 42 percent. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, again, like uh, the facility itself, which is uh, uh, being built, is for maintenance. Would that be be maintenance performed for just the trucks coming into this facility, or like? Would the trucks from other facilities be coming here as well 
as part of this maintenance activities. Just a curiosity question, if I may. Yep, that's sure. Peter, do you want to answer that question? On the, yeah, maintenance the, facility? The, maintenance, the maintenance facility that's proposed here is meant to, um, for trucks only that are coming and going from this facility as part of their operations. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, you, thank you. you. And you, Peter, you confirmed that that is FedEx only trucks? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. The other concern which I would like to bring up is regarding the noise pollution. I know uh, trucks are not, uh, there are signs not to use air brakes and such, but uh, we still see trucks using air brakes during uh, uh, nighttime. And it is, of course, when we start opening windows uh, during the summertime, it's going to be pretty noisy. And uh, we, we are already seeing hearing those noises. So just, just want to bring that up as well. Noise pollution also into consideration. Okay. That's Thank it you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, so we are going to try the cell phone number 376 one more time. If you could just unmute. Hello. This is Manny. Hello. Uh, 0376. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Manny. Thank you. Please you state your oh, name good, in full good. and then yeah. your address. Yes, my name is Manny. Last name is Lopes. I live at 96 Bartlett Street. I've been a longtime resident, at least from my view, since 1981. And boy, this street has changed significantly with the addition of facilities like A. Dewey Pile, followed by FedEx, then Amazon, and who knows what's going to come at zero Bartlett <laughs> Street, which unfortunately got passed. So we live it every day, and it's changed significantly as you hear by the other residents. Uh, the safety issues have already been discussed, which so I won't go over those. And but I will say that uh, the trucks bring with it all kinds of issues besides safety. One of which is noise, which was just raised. Uh, I live in an old 225-year-old house, so I'm very close to the road. As the previous caller noted, at night you got your windows open in the summer, you can hear it. When they go down. And, they, and it isn't the exhaust that's controlled by regulations by the you know, Federal Highway and, and Transportation Boards, right, on, on exhaust noise, how many dBs. What really is disruptive is, yes, if they back, back break, but if, the other thing is when they go down the road and hit any kind of a bump, it's the noise that the trailer makes at the connection and door or anything else. I've recorded at night at one o'clock in the morning because I was upset by it. I recorded it with my device and I was getting 90 to over 100 dB when they bounded by this road, particularly when they hit bumps or any other, um, you know, surface irregularities passing the house. And so noise is a real problem if you live on the street in the residential area. So uh, we've tried before to try to get restrictions at night unsuccessfully. And as Rachel said, even trying to get uh, you know, uh, no vehicles, uh, public commercial vehicles down this road. So we failed on that, but I will tell you, it is a real issue for the residents that live here. On the traffic count, I always hear numbers, but they always seem a lot lower than what I see as a resident that lives here. Um, for example, you, you noted that there's this extra 20 bays, which is about a 36% increase in your total number of bays, is going to add another 169 vehicles. So and you said your current trips is 394. So I have a question because 169 with a 30 something percent increase translates to a much higher number than 394. So is, is this 169 just going to be due to the addition of traffic associated with these 20 bays? Or is, and, and if it is, it doesn't match the ratio uh, of uh, current traffic. What? With the uh, number of increase, which would sort of imply that uh -huh. the entire facility is going to see an uptick in terms of its uh, utilization and overall traffic. So that would say that the forecasted number of trucks between 394 and 169 is actually going to be uh, more like 642 trucks, which uh, again seems to be underestimated. Um, with regards to the uh, the turning, I think you made it clear in your thing. And that, by the way, as other people said before, I forget, I do appreciate the fact, unlike some of the other folks who have come before boards for the town, I do, you know, recognize and respect the fact that you are trying to understand the concerns of the residents and trying to address them. That's something that I haven't seen in, in this kind of way yet. So that's a positive thing. But um you know, so the traffic seems to be 
understated in this number, or you're going to have an increase in your traffic associated with the other 56. So I guess I'd like to understand, is that true? I mean, are, we, are you going to actually see higher volume on the others to account for the, the disparity in the ratio? And um, it, it, Hey, Manny, um, I'll just, so just to give you some numbers, it's currently there's 300, approximately 394 trips are generated with the current site. 169 is the net change for a total of 563 once the build, the building is complete. So that's that's where the numbers so, come from. So the 169 is not just the traffic due to the 20 additional bays. That that, that is the net change. Yeah. So that's for, across for, all for, 76 for, bays, not just the not just the the 20 added bays. Sure. I mean it's. What, what currently happens today versus what is going to happen with the proposed site based yeah. on their model? Well, it's like a hundred, okay. it's a difference of a hundred trucks, which way you treat the 169, which is why, you know, I was, I was mentioning okay. that. Okay. The other thing Thanks, is Manny. I think that FedEx, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. If you could just uh, finish up your, your last point, it'd be great. Yeah, okay. So the other thing is, is I, I appreciate this idea of signage, but by their own admission, signs don't do anything. So, uh, you know, so you didn't find anybody. So if we have photographs that identifies a truck number, and, and I don't understand why you don't track all your trucks to be able to identify what facility they came from. Uh, it seems unreasonable that with an operation logistically, how well you run that thing, that you don't know that that vehicle we see traveling past our neighborhood at, at night or during the day, that you can't take that truck number and identify that, yes, he did indeed exit from the Amazon, I mean, your FedEx facility up there on Bartlett Street and not from somewhere else. It just, I find that hard to believe that you can't identify that so that you can then take actual uh, punitive actions, you might say, to try to enforce no left turns or no entries from the westerly part of Bartlett Street. I just, I don't understand that in this day and age with GPS tracking. And particularly if you want to stop it, have you changed any of your um, you know, navigation aids to make sure drivers know not to come down there or is it left to the driver? And what do you do about contract drivers? Okay, Thanks, okay I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to raise some of my concerns relative to the counts. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and then we have a hand up from uh, Dario. Oops. Dario, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Sec. Sorry, hold, hold on one sec. Okay, Dario, um, if you yeah. can just unmute. Hello. Can you hear hey. me now? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, I'm the guy that, that he was referring to from the design review committee. <laughs> it, just, you know, kind of for the record. Um, and I would prefer no new trucks on Bartlett, anything heading towards Route 20. And, and I understand it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with the one negative. It's it's unrealistic. They can do this by right. So I get that. Um, and I've been pretty outspoken about any traffic going past the school. But beyond that negative, and, and I'll call it a reality, um, and I think someone else said it, these guys have been as cooperative and as sensitive to these issues as anybody I've ever seen um, on Bartlett and in that case um, in my profession to be honest with you. Um, I'm the guy, it, the, the reality of the lights on Bartlett Street, it's not even as much the reflection of lights off the pond, you can just see the lights. And I believe they didn't know it when they did it originally. And they said, hey, we're gonna screen those, we're gonna stop you from seeing them. And, and 
all I can say is thank you. That that was awesome. You're doing what you can do to prevent the left hand turn, even though you don't own the property. Um, I, I I don't know how you if you're going to contribute to paying for it or whatever, but you're trying to cooperate and get that done. Um, and there's a big thank you there. Um, I know we at the design review committee said um, to put up planting so we couldn't see the building. I'm more the architect that said, hey, they don't even have to be that tall because of the angle. Um, and you guys are doing it um, anyway. And I, I thank you for that. I know you're putting up a sign which people may or may not want to read. Um, but I think you reconfiguring that left hand turn to make it more difficult. As far as I can see, there's not much more you could do. And it's also not a great burden because if they make a right, Hayes Memorial is a very quick left that puts you onto Route 20. So it's not even a huge hardship for you or Amazon or a Dewey Pile. It's a, it's a pretty simple drive around that may add 60 seconds to the trip but keeps the school and the resident residential neighborhoods safer. And yeah, you can point that out, but it's just not that big a deal. And that road, Hayes Memorial was kind of designed with all these trucks going on it anyway. So then you can get to Route 20 if you have to, to go any direction. Um, so again, all in all, I'm, I'm grateful for what you've done. No, I don't want any more traffic. But I also understand you've got a building there, and by right you can do it, and you're doing everything you can um, to help us out. And I don't have any relatives that work there, or any nephews, or you know, fruit baskets showing up in the mail. I just, mm -hmm. when somebody does something right, I just want to acknowledge it. That's that's all I could say. And I was the guy in the DRC asking for the lights bouncing off the pond because you know I drive through that area. I live here, and you guys have been great and I just I just want to say thanks for that. That's all I got. Okay. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh so at this point I don't see any other hands up from the public. Um I think <clears throat> Uh, I just want to kind of go through just sort of where we are right now. Um, so I think just for takeaways, uh, before we continue the case, uh, Peter and Jeffrey, you guys, um, you know, permission from, you know, your neighbors and Amazon in terms of trying to come up with a, a, some sort of a physical structure, the configuration, going through all the technical analysis of what that would look like, that would be great. Um, you know, I would like to see a, you know, I think one of the conditions was talking about sort of, you know, better educating the truck drivers about different routes in and out of the facility. Um, I would like to see sort of like more of a curiosity, how you got to go about doing that, what sort of training, how often you do it. Um, and then I guess just for takeaways, you know, really trying to understand how to prevent trucks coming in from the West. Right, and whether that's additional signage at Barlett and Route 20, whether it's through educational means, but um, because I think that's really where the the issues lie with sort of the truck traffic on this road. But I don't know if anyone else on the board or Lori, if anyone else had any other takeaways for the applicant at this time. Okay. Um, Chair, I have is, one more question. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute yeah. myself and raise my hand and um, everything. That's fine. I have one That's more question, good. and it was on the maintenance building. I, I'm sorry to get all my questions out on that. Is maintenance going to be performed? Um, it came up when we were a caller asked about sound. Is that going to be performed during like regular business hours, or is it going to be a 24 hour maintenance building, or is it just like Monday through Friday, eight to five? Yeah, I think it would. I think the maintenance would occur during regular um, regular working hours. Um, okay. And I think it's important to note that you know the the building is designed with high overhead doors, 
So all the maintenance activities would actually be happening interior to the building. So from a, from a noise pol pollution perspective, I think the risk of any noise pollution um, making its way off site is, is extremely low. Um, and realistically, the only buildings that might, you know, even be within earshot is the Amazon facility. It's not, we're far, far separated from uh, these residential neighborhoods with, with the proposed maintenance building. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Susie. <clears throat> All right, so I think at this point, if, it, if no one else has any other questions or comments, uh, we can entertain a motion uh, to continue to our next meeting on... Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that we continue the public hearing for 300 Bartlett Street to... Uh, June 27th, 2023 at 7 p.m. Second. Uh, Fran has made a motion to continue the hearing. Brad has seconded. Fran? Roll call Aye. Me. Brad? Aye. Mark? Aye. Susie? Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Have a good night. Uh, is Lori, um, 10 or eight, boy. All right. Uh, Lori's here. Okay. Does anybody need to take a quick break before we get into the cases or should we just plow right through these things or go through them? I should say. I'm good. Okay. Uh, let's start with 299 West main street. Anyone want to go first? Mark? Sure. Um, I think this is a, uh, actually, she's already running something in the facility. So as far as how to run a commercial establishment and taking over the property and maintaining it and all that other stuff, um, she's fully uh, set up for that. Um, she knows the area. And so that takes care of a lot of issues of what's going to happen She's already dealt with that with her current shop. Um, she's also experienced in running this, what she's proposing to do as far as running the yoga classes. So, I mean, I, I just don't see any risk in, in, in going ahead with this proposal. She knows the facility. She knows what her business. She's demonstrated both of them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, anyway, uh, Susie? I agree with Mark. Um, she does, she runs classes now at her current um, studio or shop, and she had talked about the app, um, and it's in the same building. She knows the area. She knows the parking lot well, I think. She'll be well equipped with everything, you know, no maintenance, anything. I think she's already there, so it'll you know, it won't be too hard of a jump for anything. Okay, thanks, Susie. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? I guess what I would just say is I agree. Um, I think that this is an appropriate use for the facility. Um, there's really no expansion, no outdoor use. The hours, I mean, are acceptable. Um, seems like it's only several hours during the week, mostly in the morning and at night. Um, there's no impact to the groundwater. There's no chemicals. Um, I don't really see an issue with, with this project at all. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Uh, is there a motion on the floor? Mark? I'll make a motion that we, uh, this is for a site plan um, approval for the property at 299 West Main Street. Um, you gave us a sketch, right, Lori? Yes. Yeah. So she is yeah. actually requesting two permits. 
Um, so it's a special permit, permit for use, as well as a special permit okay. for uh, site plan approval. approval. Yeah. And okay. I have no problems with your your outline. Yep. Okay. All right. So Mark made a motion to approve, um, or made a motion to approve the special permit uh, for the indoor commercial commercial recreation use and the special permit with site plan approval for the operation of a yoga studio at 229 West Main Street, Map 82, Parcel 7. Parcel 7. Uh, Brad seconded that motion. Uh, Mark? Aye. Brad? Aye. Uh, Fran? Aye. Susie? Aye. Uh, and I'm an I as well. All right. Seventy eight West Main Street. Okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, friend. Okay, so I'll start. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to repurpose what was once a residential property back to residential. I think it does work very nicely with the master plan implementation and revitalization of downtown. And as long as they can address all the concerns about the wetlands as it relates to the conservation commission, I don't see a problem with it moving forward. So. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Susie. I, I have um I have some concerns. Um the the fence for the snow removal is behind. Um it feels like it's been a long time since we reviewed this. I can't remember what that um grassy area is called. I feel like we did this case hours ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I, the rain garden. I, I think Yes, no. <laughs> the rain garden. Sorry, it's been, it's been a while. <laughs> so they moved the fence, so it's in between the parking lot and the rain garden. Okay, so I just I have concerns about the drainage, even though they they say that they're not going to use the salt. Um, it being pushed, what the sludge is going to be pushed from. You know, it even happens in my own driveway when then DPW goes by and you you get the stuff that goes into your own driveway and then what's going to be pushed into it. I'm not having a report from the conservation committee. Um, I have concerns about that. I have concerns about a four bedroom apartment being um, so close and because it's, it, you know, I had attended um, a couple things on the new um, firehouse, the fire station directly, you know, even if it's kitty corner right across the street and on that curve from the fire station going from a quiet business to a four bedroom apartment with a tight parking lot. Um, and it is a tight parking lot. If you look at the staggered mm -hmm. spots, some are a little bit farther back. I drive, I drive a minivan. I don't know if any of you knew that. <laughs> I, can't, yeah, I can't say that with a straight face, but I drive a minivan. I used to drive an SUV where the doors open and even with the staggered spots, it might be, I don't know, harder to get in and out. Um, I just, I don't know. Um, and in the, and that is a, I just don't know about having an apartment building right there. Um, so I don't know if I'm really for it. And um, I did take a lot of notes here. So building into the wetlands um, and exasperating the cold, the code violation and with that, but, um, and you're doubling the amount of cars for the parking lot and the cars are what adds to the pollution. Um, so that's pretty much, those are my problems with the, the lot, with this project right now. Yeah. I'm gonna put it on mute because I might start coughing after talking so much, thank you. Okay. Um... Yeah, Brad, sorry. Yeah, and the reason why I, I voted against closing the hearing is I can't recall any other hearing that we've had without getting feedback from conservation. And that was a major concern for I myself as well as other members of the board. And I really didn't get a good answer. 
and it raised red flags that they wouldn't really want to close this thing quickly tonight. And looking at the parking lot today, yeah, I know the, the driveway is a mess, but uh, it's one unit today. It is um, uh, an office and plenty of parking. The parking is super tight. Um, the other point is the traffic, uh, no crashes have, uh, according to the traffic study. And so I wouldn't mess with a good thing, um, right now. Um, the other point I already wanted to make is, um, yeah, the snow, um, yeah, it's, and they just kept saying, oh, it's a very tight site. It's a very tight site. They're making it a very tight site based on what they want to do here. OK, it's not a tight site as it is today. And I know, Lori, you mentioned that it's conforming today. So it's non it's not non-conforming to a more non-conforming. But they're asking for five different things here. I mean, that's too much. Honestly, that's too much for me. OK, I mean, it's perfectly fine as it is today. And why why go from something that is conforming to something that's non-conforming, to be honest with you? So the, and there's a, just a bunch of red flags. And because I didn't hear from conservation, I'm a hard no on this project. Okay. Um, I guess this is more of a question for Lori. Um, what sort of feedback do you think or I should say, did you attend the site visit with conservation? No. So, uh, uh, Vinny, so there is no requirement that they file with conservation commission first. It really is up to the applicant who the, he wants to file with first. Sometimes they file concurrently. Sometimes they go to conservation first. Sometimes they go to ZBA or planning first. So there really isn't something that we either advise or require. Um, so I, I don't think that you can deny a permit based on the fact that they didn't go to a different board first. That's not a criteria you can use in my opinion. Within the conditions they I guess, I guess. conservation. That resolves the issue. And if they don't get the okay from conservation, it doesn't move forward. It's that simple. Well, so I, I guess like Lori, what, what do you think would be um what do you think would be a, an issue with like that conservation would have with the wetlands and building into the wetlands in the no build zone? I think this is probably a better question for Fred, but if Conservation Commission has an issue with something that they're proposing to do within a wetland buffer area, then they would require a modification to the plan. And if it's a substantial modification, then they'd have to come back to the ZBA for approval for that. If it's a minor modification, then you know, they just make that change. So well, so there is a condition of approval that says that they're gonna give us a final set of plans. Um, so that final set of plans would incorporate any changes that Conservation Commission would mandate as part of their approval. So if, Hypothetically, if conservation said, we don't want you to build in wetlands for whatever the reason conservation says, they would not be able to move forward with the project. Well, they're not building within the wetlands. So they're not, they're not altering the wetlands from my understanding. So this is buffer area that we're talking about, but Fred, maybe, maybe you should speak to it. The, that's correct. They're not proposing to build in the wetlands they're proposing to build in the no build zone which is in our local bylaw the local wetlands bylaw that prohibits construction within uh 35 feet of the mm -hmm. agreed upon boarding vegetated wetland 
Now the commission, I believe, has informally agreed with the wetland delineation, but that's always subject to final approval with an order of conditions. Um, the commission did increase their setbacks from 15 and 25 to 25 and 35 feet, and now um, they're encroaching in that. The applicant's uh, comments was that he's not encroaching any closer to the edge of the wetlands than they were before, before the proposed addition. But it's in, there's more encroachment, more of the building is at that same minimal setback from the edge of the wetlands, all of which is within the local bylaw that requires it to be 35 feet. So if the commission feels strongly that they don't want to grant that construction within 35 feet, then they can they can deny that portion. And then the applicant would have to decide if the project's still worth doing and come back to you because taking off one of those two additions would be, I would consider a significant uh, change mm -hmm. to the plan and warrant coming back to the ZBA if in fact they wanted to proceed with the project with a, a different footprint. Okay, thanks, Fred. Uh, Fred? Oh, I, I'm just sitting here racking my brains over the last several years that I've been on the zoning board. We have had um, applicants come before us who have gone to conservation and conservation says they have no problem and then we still deny them for other reasons. So the idea that as long as there's a condition that says they have to adhere to whatever conservation says, it becomes a moot point whether they came to us first or them. Um, to Brad's point, but right now it is an unused commercial building that is not benefiting the town in any way, shape or form. Bringing housing alternative to single family homes it, within walking distance of what we want to be a vital downtown, downtown is, is really important. Um, you know, somebody's gonna wanna live there. Somebody's gonna figure out how to um, park their cars in those parking spaces. Um, and they're putting more grass in the back of the building. They're getting rid of some of the impervious surface. So it's actually making it better. Um, I mean, I don't see how this cannot be an improvement or benefit to the town on the whole. If it helps, Paul, I'd like to point out yeah. that the groundwater committee that met and reviewed the project consisted of three members, one of which was the representative from the Conservation Commission and the, com the groundwater committee looked at it as an overall improvement to the site with the improved stormwater system and the parking lot and the drainage and that work within the floodplain and closer to the groundwater two area being removed. So they looked at it as an overall improvement. I can't say that the rest of the commission would agree, but that one member who was sitting with the groundwater committee did agree and they voted unanimously, the three of them to recommend approval on that based on that. Okay, uh, thanks Fred. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I mean, yep. you throw out my comment regarding the conservation, the fact that it's a conforming structure and we're moving it to non-conforming is another issue with me. The fact that, okay, we're getting rid of number four special permit uh, expansion of non-conforming building, we can strike that, but we're, we're, they're asking for three special permits and a variance to go from a conforming structure to a non-conforming structure. And all due respect, I think we're doing this backwards where we're, we're increasing housing. You look across the street, um, there's a, a, a multi mixed use structure at the corner of Presidential and Route 20. Every apartment is full, every, uh, every uh, office or every store is completely empty, okay? But I think we need to, I think we're doing this backwards. I think we need to fix downtown and we need to get, bring businesses into downtown and then the people will come. I think we're doing this completely backwards and this is another example of, of what we're doing wrong. Um, Paul, if I may, I, I have to yeah. say that I really disagree with you being the planning director 
Um, in order to, to spur downtown revitalization, you need to have people living in the downtown. So right now there is a minimal number of people living downtown. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have a lot of activity downtown. So, and the type of activity that exists is very auto dependent. Um, so the people who are, are patronizing those businesses for the most part are driving to those businesses. Mm -hmm. They're parking, they're going into the business they're getting into their car and they're leaving. So in order to make a pedestrian friendly downtown, it is super, super important that you have people living in the downtown that are gonna walk. They're gonna walk to the Dunkin' Donuts. They're gonna walk to the gym across the street. So it's not gonna be auto dependent. You're, you're finally gonna have some activity, some life, um, some vibrancy on the street level with people going in between, you know, the, the apartments and the various businesses. So that's what you want. If, if you want your downtown to be exactly the way it is today, then don't build any multifamily housing. It won't change. Okay, thanks, Lori. Uh, Susie? It, it seems like it's, in my opinion, like it's too big of a unit holder for too small of a spot and too big of a parking lot for too small of a spot. I feel like it's being squeezed into too small of a spot and made to fit. Um, and that's just the impression that I got. I just imagined um, people with kids moving in there and buses picking up and if there is was there a light that was going to go in there I don't even know if um or how where was were they going to or the fire chief was just going to control the light that was down the way if when it's, the if there's an alarm that goes off it's four it's four two Susie it's four two bedroom apartments so right the, the children so a single mom could have logistically right. could have two kids the yeah. firehouse is down the road but a single mom could a single parent can move in there with two kids so i'm saying if the school bus stop or if fire the fire truck's coming out like what um where were they going to install light i don't know if bob or fred no. you know or were they going to control when he talks about controlling a light if in the new fire station when they come out, was it the light that already exists? I'm just trying to, I was just trying to work through scenarios if there was kids living there and the school bus stop and the fire trucks are coming out. Um, just, you know, you always have to think of scenarios. I just, the project didn't sit well with me and the parking lot's awkward. And I know you can always find people to live that'll park their cars anywhere, but that doesn't mean that it's a good project or a good parking lot. Yes, Bob. If I may, through the chair, um, yep. I'm just going to interject a story. I was a firefighter for 20 years in Grafton, and I drove those trucks on almost every call. Mm -hmm. And right across from the street from the fire firehouse in Grafton, from both firehouses we used, were multifamily buildings with kids and bus stops and busy roads. We never had a problem with that. And, and if we can navigate fire trucks through a busy Grafton Center Common on the 4th of July parade and the concert going on, I wouldn't worry about it pulling out in front of Dunkin' Donuts or in front of a four bedroom apartment, a four unit apartment. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right. Uh, so I guess that leaves me. Um, so I think this project um, generally is an improvement on what currently exists there. Um, I do agree that encroaching on the wetlands is not ideal. And I would like to have conservation 
conservation's input in that regard, which we do obviously are going to have a condition in there that if conservation has an issue with this project encroaching on the wetlands, that it does not move forward. Um, in terms of the parking, I think for me, it is a tight spot in the parking. Um, I am very concerned with the snow. Um, I would like to see a condition added that has any uh, excess snow be removed by truck after a snowfall. And I don't know, Lori, how you can write that. Um, but the idea that they, you know, <clears throat> I think having the fence along that back wall is important. And Lori, I have not seen the updated um, plan for that, but I, I believe you said you have. You're muted, Lori. I have it right here. I can share my screen. Okay. Uh, this is the fence right here. I'm pointing it to it with my arrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's right here. Mm -hmm. Right. So is there no fence along that where the dumpster is then? There's a fence around the dumpster. So this is uh, this symbol right here is denoting a gate. So it's a double gate. So the fence goes all the way around the dumpster. Yep. Then there's a separate fence that goes there. Okay. Is there any way that we can ask for that fence to be moved forward closer to the uh, driveway? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I would like to, I don't know how anyone else feels, but I would like to see that uh, included in the uh, final, in a final decision. Um, and then I would also like to see um, the condition of having the snow removed um, from the property in a timely fashion. I don't know, Lori, how do you usually write those? So uh, right now I have the language in condition L. So uh, the last sentence says, excess snow shall be disposed of offsite. I can add via truck. Um, I could say within, um, what do you wanna say? I mean, it depends on the size of the snow event, how quickly the snow is going to be removed. Uh, if it's a, a two foot snowstorm, then chances are they'll come twice, one in the middle of the storm and then one at the end. Mm -hmm. But it, it's hard to put a time, time frame on snow removal. Obviously, the tenants who live there will need cleared spaces right. so it's in their be best interest to remove the snow in a timely fashion so i, I usually could... don't put a restriction on there about when the snow has to be removed i could see 24 hours and just figure that they'll <clears throat> get it off in a timely manner not if Unless, Bob, you feel you'd be required to enforce that and it'd be a, a mess. Well, I, I, I think anything that goes in a decision is enforceable by, right. by me. Um, you know, I mean, am I going to show up, you know, with a 23 and a half hour clock? Um, <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to do. You know, if it's if it's been there, you know, a few days and you know, the parking, you know, you can't fit all the cars on the lot and I have to make some phone calls. Um, well, I think the tenants at that point are going to make phone calls. I would I would think they would do it far ahead of, the, of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, some some companies require that after a storm, the you know, all of the cars be removed for a certain amount of time so they can get in and clear the entire lot in one in one fell swoop. Um you know, I'm not sure how this management 
team is going to do that, but um, that's a very common practice. Mr. Chair, I think that yep, it would, friend. I noticed that in the, um, the draft decision, um, it says eight, no more than eight feet of snow. We may want to bring it down below the level of the fence. If, it's, if they're putting it up against the fence, it probably shouldn't be more than whatever the height of the fence is, which would help prevent any excessive melting, you know, getting into the wetlands too. I can change that to four feet. Well, I don't know what height, the height of the fence was. Four feet, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, then you definitely don't want it six, eight feet of snow. Yeah. Uh Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, Mark. Yeah, uh, a split rail fence. Are we talking about the posts and then two spans of rail between them so that this is going to be porous to a snowplow pretty much anyway? Yes, it's a split uh, rail fence. I believe there's a detail. Uh, I thought it was a chain link. Uh, there's, um, no, I'm pretty sure it's a split rail from what I recall. Oh, it is. I mean, I see it doing more to stop people from moving through rather than, uh, hmm. piles of snow, but. I think it was something that was preliminarily talked about with the Conservation Commission to kind of define where people wouldn't go beyond mm -hmm. uh, with the grass area and walking and traveling into the rain garden and ultimately into the wetland area. Uh, it's really just more of a demarcation of the line. Mm -hmm. um, if you move it closer to the pavement, then it's going to be closer to the pile and more likely to get pushed over. Uh, but you could certainly move it a little bit but it's this is uh i think four feet in that area and then have a condition that says it's removed within 24 hours of the end of the storm event um seems pretty reasonable most people are out there within a day after the snowstorm's over clearing out their spots and getting on with their life um and then this is a detail of the split rail fence mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah I guess, right. Yeah, I mean, a split rail doesn't do anything for us. Right. So, I mean, I, I guess, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, a part of me does agree that, you know, this is an improvement in terms of, um, you know, what's currently there and reducing some of the impervious service and back. Um, I also do agree. I do think that we should not rush into a decision um, based upon sort of open, open items. Um, so, I mean, I guess, Lori, do we need to make a decision on this tonight? Um, no, you have 90 days from the close of the, well, actually, uh, for the variance, you have a total of 100 days. So this application was filed on April 14th. So we'd have to count from April 14th. I, and yeah, you definitely are uh, well within 100 days. All right. So I, I, I will say that I am, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I'm leaning towards approving this this case with conditions, I just want to be very clear and sure that the conditions that we are approving, right, make sense rather than doing it at 1041 on a Tuesday night. Um, so given that, you know, and if that requires us to, to meet back in two weeks, or if we punt this to next month, uh, I'm willing to do that. Um, but I want to make sure that we sort of dot all the I's and cross all the T's, <clears throat> you know, before we actually make a decision. Um, so I guess, Lori, what do, what do you suggest would be 
Like, what do you suggest we, you think we could do? I mean, should we just not make a decision tonight for this case and then come back next meeting? You know, and are we allowed at that point to sort of have any adjustments? Do we reopen the case to allow for them to improve sort of some of the, the snow removal capabilities or... I suppose, uh, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with. I, I'm going to tell you I'm on vacation uh, for the next meeting. So Fred will be flying solo uh, with Bob. Um, but of course, I can have everything ready to go as long as I'm clear on what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I guess then... And when is I'll conservation I'll, I'll, meeting? When is conservation meeting? Well, that will depend on when they actually make their filing. I'm sorry, Brad. Uh, oh. Paul, I, I meant to say through the chair. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, so they I, I guess. Yep. Yeah, sorry, Fred. They Go indicated ahead. they might file later this week. And if they yep. do that, then they might get on the June meeting, which is June 12th. <laughs> um, but it, it all depends on them. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I guess then what I would say is, um, you know, I for me, for me personally, my opinion is that, you know, I am trending towards, you know, having all the conditions in place, you know, allowing for this project to move forward. Right. But my concern is obviously the snow removal and specifically a final detailed plan that addresses that. Brad also has a concern with the Conservation Commission mm -hmm. meeting. I think a an appropriate thing that we could do as a board, and I'm, I'm, I welcome feedback here, is that we can open the case back up and then punt this or continue this uh, case until our next meeting, which in which time we will allow the applicant to come up with a better snow removal plan, provide any feedback that they may have in, in terms of reviewing uh, removing snow within 12 hours or 16, or maybe there's something that we were missing there. The Conservation Commission can also meet as well, which will help one of the other board members as well um, mm -hmm. and their concerns. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's my proposal for, for right now okay. for, for this case. Um, I welcome feedback from the others. All right. Mr. Chair, I think that I think it's fine if we don't make a decision tonight and that we have all our ducks in a row for our next meeting. I would not recommend reopening it with the reposting another public hearing to get more input. We can put conditions on that they'll either agree to or not based on what okay. Lori can draft between mm -hmm. now and our next meeting and with feedback from conservation versus reopening, I mean, reposting it and reopening it. I don't even know how you would do that. Yeah. So I guess, Lori, the question I have is, can we take in new information by keeping the case open? Um, if, if you reopen the public hearing, so the only, you can reopen the public hearing tonight. So essentially what you would do is you would rescind your vote, um, closing the public hearing. And, uh, so then it would be opened. And then at that case, in that case, if they revise the plan, then you can look at the revised plan. If once right. the public hearings close, then you can't take any additional testimony. So you can't hear feedback right. from the applicant. You can't look at revisions. It's it's okay. just what you have before you today. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So then I, I think, friend, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think we should open the case, which will allow the conservation to provide any comments. Um, they can provide us with a final plan. You know, we can quickly get all of our ducks in a row within the next month or so. This would be, will be a first item on, on the agenda for next meeting and we can take in all of our information, close the case and hopefully move forward. Does that, that makes, sound like? That sounds fine to me. I mean. I like it. Okay. Works for me. Right. Okay. So all is right. there. So Mr. Chair, I move that we, Mr. Chair, I move that we yeah. rescind our, the closing of the hearing for 78 West Main Street to Reopen the public hearing, posting it for the June twenty seventh meeting at seven ten p.m. Okay. Second. 
Brad made a motion and Mark second, seconded to reopen the uh, 70 uh, West Main Street hearing. Um, Fran? Aye. Mark? Aye. Brad? Aye. Susie? Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye as well. All right. Uh, so we will come back to that one uh, in a moment. Um, all right, so moving on, um, election of officers. Oh. Um, so I think, um, so I'm the chair and Brad is the current clerk. Um, Mr. Uh, chair? Guess, yep. I move that we just reappoint you if you're willing to be the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for another year. <laughs> I second, Fran. Sorry. Yeah. This, yeah. I mean, unless you really don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I still I, second, I Fran. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I can't read my resignation letter. <laughs> no. No. All right. no, I mean, seriously, I mean, unless you really don't want to, but I'm, I, I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, thank you, Fran. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Susie. Uh, so I guess for chair, Fran made a motion uh, to appoint me as the chair and Susie uh, seconded that. Um, roll call vote, Fran. Aye. Susie. Aye. Mark. Aye. Brad. Aye. Uh, and I guess I'm an aye as well. <laughs> all right cool uh and then i guess for uh clerk um i believe brad is the current clerk of the zoning board at the current moment uh yeah Mr. Susie. chair oh. sorry. Uh, sorry Susie, did you have your hand raised oh, I, I was gonna make a motion to re-elect brad as chair or That's not okay. as chair sorry as clerk it's been a long night, you guys. Yeah. Unless he's got carpal tunnel syndrome from signing everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, friend, did you second that or? I think, sure. Okay. So Susie made a motion to nominate Brad as the clerk. Fran seconded. Uh, roll call vote, Susie. Aye. Uh, Fran. Aye. Mark. Aye. Uh, I'm an aye. Brad. Aye. All right. Um, so the next item on the agenda is consideration of minutes from the February 28th, 2023 meeting. I move um, that we accept the minutes of the February 20, February 28th, 2023 minutes as submitted. Second. Second. All right. Uh, sorry, Mark, uh, Brad beat you there. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so Fran made a motion to approve the minutes. Brad seconded. Uh, Fran. Aye. Brad. Aye. Mark. Aye. Susie? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Um, oh, I think I skipped one. Um, reappoint Janet Sandstrom to the Earthwork Board. Uh, Lori, are you still there? I, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, so this is just one of the appointments that the ZBA has? Yeah. Yep. So she's your representative to that board. Cool. Uh, do I hear a motion uh, to reappoint Janet? Uh, was there any other applicants for this position? Do you know? Uh, no. Is, oh, go ahead, Fred. I'm sorry. I work with the Earthwork Board. Uh, Janet is currently the chair, and um, okay. uh, it was never advertised as an opening, as far as I know, and she needs to be reappointed before their next meeting. Otherwise, she can't attend. Okay. And at the last okay. meeting, we did have a quorum issue. I move okay. that we reappoint her to the Earthworks Commission. Second. All right, Mark made a motion to reappoint Janet Sandstrom to the Earthworks Board. Brad seconded. Uh, roll call vote, Mark. Aye. Brad? Aye. Fran? Aye. Uh, Susie? Aye. And I have an aye as well. Uh, so our next meeting is June 27th, uh, 2023 uh, at 7 p.m. Um, and we will have two continues. Uh, and Lori, I believe we have two other cases as well. Two new cases coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. Going to be a busy meeting. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It, and Lori, we, don't have to, we don't have to have a meeting in like two weeks, as you said, because we'll be within the 100 days. So it'll be... Well, Mm -hmm. The fact that we reopened the meeting, or reopened okay. the case, means that we're not right. bound by the deadlines. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lori, but if you don't close the special permit, you can keep it open for us. I think it's as long as you want, right? 
Uh, special permit, you have 90 days from the close of the public close. hearing, but this public okay. hearing still open, so you're good. Yep, got it. And you'll oh. let the applicant know, Lori? Absolutely. They know. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Just making sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, is there, does anyone else have any other, anything else at 10.52 p.m. that they would like to update the board with. <laughs> what a last meeting Fred's going to have. <laughs> yeah. Before he retires. Not with a bang, Fred. <laughs> kind of yeah. makes me a, a little bit uh, regretful that that's going to be his last <laughs> meeting. <laughs> but I, I might be snickering a little bit to myself, too. <laughs> it depends on how it goes, Lori. These could all be continued to July. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> That is a good point. <laughs> Just want to let you know the Celtics are up by. Uh, Don't say anything. <laughs> Just almost <laughs> enough. All right. Yeah, they have a minute uh, and one second left. If they blow it in one minute and one second, my husband will jump out of the second story. Window. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the sake of time, um, does it? Uh, does anyone else have any other updates with anything or? wants to bring to the board um, about, I don't know, anything that's going on. All right. Summer concert series. Everybody better attend. That's wearing my other hat. We're very excited about one of the concerts. We have a Northborough uh, singer that was featured on The Voice. It's one of our um, concerts, Zach and Gold. So I hope at least that concert everyone will come to, but we have great bands. So check out our, um, our website and our Facebook page. Community. And Lori, have a nice vacation if we don't see you. Yes. Yep. All right, everyone. All right. Is there, do I have a motion to adjourn? Anyone? I'll make a so motion. Moved. To All right. Uh, Susie made a thing and Fran seconded. So. Second. Yeah. Uh, Susie. Aye. Fran. Aye. Mark. Aye. Brad. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Good night. everybody.